Okay, let's call this meeting to order. It's very nice to have a lot of live participants. Thanks for coming. Thanks for people on Zoom. Uh, I'd like to start this meeting with a moment of silence for Nancy Cronin, who has passed away. Nancy was a long time town clerk and very active in many volunteer groups like the League of Women Voters. So if we could just have a moment of silence. Thank you. OK. Um, we have one member who is not able to join us tonight. And we will start with the consent calendar. Uh, first, I'd like to make an amendment or propose an amendment to the consent agenda, which is uh, to uh, actually release the executive session minutes. So to strike, not to be released, uh, because the matter discussed at that executive session is now uh, public. In okay. Any uh, is, a second to that motion? Is there a that, second? I'll second that. Okay. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, move uh, to approve the consent agenda, which includes the town accountant warrant of March 31st, 2022, uh, the revised uh, November 22nd, 2021 executive session minutes, and uh, the gift acceptance uh, from James B. Terry Jr. for of $100,000 for the electrification of municipal vehicles and equipment. Is there a second? Second. Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. And thanks very much for that gift. Thanks that was so a much. Very generous gift. Thank you. Okay, next we have the town manager's report. Good evening. Absentee voting by mail is uh, now available. The deadline to apply for absentee ballots by mail is 5 p.m. on Wednesday, April 6th. Okay. <laughs> The deadline to apply in person for absentee ballots. Oh, Sorry, it's not. A, the, the deadline to apply in person for absentee ballots is noon on Monday, April 11th, and all absentee ballots must be returned to the town clerk's office by 8 p.m. on Election Day, which is Tuesday, April 12th. I wanted to announce that we had a retirement um, last week. Our firefighter Arthur St. John retired from the Concord Fire Department. He had served for the fire department for over 30 years. He was appointed to the fire department in October 1990. Prior to that, he was a full-time employee of the Public Works Department. He served as a call firefighter prior to his full-time employment with the fire department. And he is among a small group of employees who were instrumental in the early days of GIS systems implementation in town and he has served as the GIS liaison to the f for the fire department to the Department of um, Information Technology and he has been instrumental in providing access to critical information in um, and helping to prepare for emergencies. Arthur is a lifelong resident of the town of Concord and we all wish him well in his retirement. Just a few additional updates. Um, April is Autism Awareness Month. There was some information in your packet about all of the activities that the police department is undertaking to support autism awareness, including uh, wearing patches on Fridays. Patches um, are also avail available for purchase at the police station. They will be displaying blue lights in the police station. Over the weekend, they participated in the light, light it up blue event. Um, there are some additional events going on in, su in support of autism awareness, including some training that officers will undertake this month. All the proceeds from the sale of patches will be donated by the Relief Association to Minuteman ARC. There's some information in the packet about some public works projects. Um, we are getting ready to resume work on Hubbard Street this month. We will be restriping the parade route prior to the parade, so the road looks nice um, for everybody who is coming out to, to view that event. Um, we have a contract for crack sealing. There's some information about some of the other 
uh, work that we are doing, including um, improvements to Commonwealth Ave. The Highway and Grounds Division opened the compost site this past weekend. It is now open on Wednesdays from 3 to 6 and Saturdays 9 to 3 throughout the season. It is available to all Concord residents for non-commercial purposes. There's some information in the packet about rebates that CMLP is offering for air source heat pumps, either for home, whole home or for partial, um, partial home improvements. Some additional information on mass save grants also for the air source heat pumps. This Saturday, we open the bike share program. We have two locations uh, with bikes available in Concord Center at the Visitor Center and in West Concord at the MBTA lot. I happened to be out today and, and I did see two of the five bikes were gone. So people are already making use of it. it it's really nice if, if you're interested in, you don't want to bring your bike to, um, to the Bruce Freeman Rail Trail. You can actually rent a bike and take it out for an hour or so. There's a lot of additional information in the packet. Um, I'm happy to answer questions. I, I don't want to take up any more of your time because I know you have a busy agenda this evening. Thank you. Are there questions from the board? I, I would just like to highlight that the rebates you mentioned, um, Carrie, are extremely generous for the air source heat pumps. So I hope people will mm -hmm. uh, tune into that information. Right, so up to $10,000 locally for the air source heat pump rebate. Yeah. Matt? Yeah, will there be a spring swap off, drop off event this year? There is. I don't remember the date. I was just talking to Melissa Simoncini last week. She's, she's the staff person at of CPW that organizes the event and and i can get that date out to you well i'm also just curious whether the procedures that had been changed for COVID are going to change back to a more normal mode of operation yeah so we will we'll get information out on that because we were talking about procedures okay as well at least for me as i i consider myself a less than competent homeowner <laughs> that I, you know, to be able to prepare in advance and tell everybody exactly what I'm going to bring, you mm -hmm. know, well in advance and pay in advance is impractical. Okay. Let's say it's okay. also how some of us uh, furnish our homes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thanks. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you, uh, Chair's remarks. We have the town election on April twelfth. May 1st is town meeting. It's a Sunday at 1 p.m. at the high school. Also, there's a pretty long list of events now for Patriots Day, which is really exciting. We haven't been able to do that in a few years. Please check the website for all the events. Um, most of them are Patriots Day weekend, but one is this coming weekend. Also, there will be a public forum um, held by the Fiber Broadband Task Force on April 14th at 7 p.m. in the townhouse. Um, please try and attend either in live or by Zoom. And I wanted to ask the board members next week, are you available to come at 6 o'clock p.m. for an executive session? Yep. Two yeses and one maybe. Henry, let me know. Okay, we, okay. we want to schedule that um, with council. Okay, thank you. All right, we now go to the request for handout at town meeting from the Concord for Ukraine group. I see Heather and Phil, if you'd like to come up. Do you want to join you? Yes. Please. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much. So we realize your time is fully occupied, so we're going to be brief. Uh, I'm going to start, and Heather, who's filling in for Carrie, um, Rankin, who's just come down with COVID. Oh. Yeah. So anyway, good evening to all of you. My name is Phil Villers. 
I live at 20 Wits End Road, have lived there for 50 years, uh, but I actually came to this country as a refugee when I was five, left France two hours ahead of the German army. So I was fortunate enough to become an American. Um, what we want to talk about is the work of Concord for Ukraine, a humanitarian <coughs> campaign to provide medical supplies and related to the many victims in the Ukraine. Let's spend a moment to talk about what's going on in Ukraine, although I'm sure you're also well informed. This is this morning's globe, which I'll pass around the front page. As you've probably read, around the capital of Ukraine, a number of towns have just been freed and they're finding horrible things. People have been tortured, civilians had their hands bound behind their backs before being shot in the head. And this is just for the first few towns that have been freed again. So that's the north. In the south, a very large city, Maripol, with normally 430,000 inhabitants, is totally in ruins because of shelling, bombing, missiles, the whole nine yards. Where are the people from Maripol, the ones who are still there, and the Russians have prevented most, or at least a great many, to be able to leave, are living in basements or cellars, no electricity, no water, and they're starving. So this is the humanitarian crisis the world is watching. A number of towns have passed resolutions of solidarity with the people of Ukraine and we're hopeful that Concord, through your hands, will do the same. I might add, we came to here with a proposed resolution on that. And we just found out that Henry Dane had uh, written something that was significantly superior. <laughs> so we would be happy to have you consider a better version written by a lawyer, which I'm not. Um, in Maripol, back to the south there, uh, the bombing has paid special attention to hitting hospitals, schools, and refugee centers. This is the kind of inhuman behavior that we in Concord have a long tradition of speaking out. And that's what we're talking about. So, so, so Phil, I, I don't mean to cut you off. Uh, this is- uh, I was about to stop and turn it over to Heather. Okay. Um, so I understand that you are here for two things tonight. One is to ask the select board for a resolution. And the other is about a handout at town meeting. Yes, and, and Heather will speak. To well, I don't both. Know. Okay. I, I will well, not keep going on, but why don't I get into logistics for a minute first? I probably have to state. Well, I was name. just going to say, let's do one of the things at a time. Okay. So, so um, do you, since you've talked about the resolution, do you want to, should we do that first or? Sure, that's fine. Um, they do, they do connect, although we can do the resolution first and then I can give you the, more of the background on what the handout is. If you need my name and address for okay. the record. It's Heather Bowd. I'm at 52 Simon Willard Road. <laughs> okay, thank you. And, you know, I mean, no question, it's a horrific situation. It is. And many of us are very eager to help, so that is certainly not 
That's great. So let me just quickly, before we get to the motion itself, let me just tell you what we are doing to help and okay. how we're hoping to enable other Concord residents to do the same. So we're a group who's come together, um, obviously feeling helpless and wanting to do something. Um, thanks to uh, Igor and Irina Kowal, who spent many years in Ukraine and now are Concord residents, we've connected and partnered with an organization called Ukraine Forward. And the way it works is that they um, are shipping supplies, medical and even army supplies to the forces there and to civilians. Um, they're shipping from their location in Jamaica Plain, they're collecting supplies at a church, shipping it over there, and then university students are helping to distribute. Um, the way that we can help is through their website, which is ukraineforward.org. And I'm sorry if the link was wrong, it said .com, if anybody checked to check it out, it's actually ukraineforward.org. Um, so that's, I apologize for the, the wrong link there. They, people can either donate directly or can use their Amazon wish list. Um, and I can tell you how simple it is. I've done it myself. You purchase things from their wish list, it gets delivered to their to the church that they're using as a base in Jamaica Plain, and they're shipping things over. Um, so far, they have shipped over $250,000 in supplies. They've collected $50,000 in cash, which they're using for the same thing. 12,000 they've spent on transportation costs, and they've made 12 shipments over there. So this is a way to help in a way that we know for sure that supplies are getting to the right place. Money is not getting lost in administration when you donate. So it's something that we feel strongly about. Um, we would like you to make a statement on behalf of supporting Ukraine. And so that's where we get into this. And it's two, two phases. One is a statement in support. And like Phil said, we have a, a short drafted motion, but we are certainly open to something more detailed if somebody wanted to recommend one. I, I know Henry Dane had something in mind. The second thing is a handout at town meeting. And I do realize that that would have to be approved by the moderator. Um, our moderator has taken a look at this idea and is open to it. So it would just need a request from, from this group. And we do have handouts of what the, or sorry, copies of what the handout would look like. So we have plenty right, of those to right. share with you. Okay, we okay. have that. So, okay, thank you, so, Heather. Sure, so now moving to the, do you wanna address um, the motion first? Well, um, Henry, do you wanna talk about your um, oh, <clears throat> motion? You know how um, diligently I've been pursuing uh, the revival of Patriots Day and the uh, former ceremonies, and also <clears throat> how uh, earnest I've been about attempting to uh, obtain some participation in that those activities by representatives of Ukraine. Um, and being somewhat frustrated by how that has been going, um, I put together what I thought would be an appropriate a proclamation for the town to declare where it stood on these issues and in the context of Patriot's Day. And I would like to read it and I will pass some copies around. Um, I know that this is there, but there are many things that have come before you three minutes ago anyway, but these come out of thin air. Uh, this is called the proclamation recognizing the suffering and heroism of the Ukrainian people in the struggle for liberty and independence, Patriots Day 2022. Whereas the shot fired at the North Bridge 247 years ago still reverberates and calls up the spirit of liberty and human dignity wherever its echo is heard. And whereas against all odds, but with faith in the power of the Almighty and the human spirit, the people of Concord challenged the overwhelming might of the greatest empire on earth with a spirit that crave to be free, independent, and to live in a democratic society that valued human equality. And whereas the people of Concord, either by choice or birth, have received this historic gift as an awesome and sacred responsibility, together with the obligation to preserve and transmit its undim undiminished blessings to future generations, and whereas since that day in 1775, our men and women have answered the call of freedom over and over again to rise up against tyranny, brutality, and attempts to degrade the human spirit. Whereas if the power of good is still alive within us, 
Deeds of human courage are called for now more than ever because of the overwhelming destructive and coercive powers in the hands of totalitarian governments, giving them the ability to inflict pain and death beyond human imagination or understanding. And whereas the brave and heroic people of Ukraine have fought their oppressors valiantly, and for that have suffered beyond measure at the hands of the Russian government, which in a brutal and unprovoked invasion of a free and democratic nation has shown its determination to destroy without conscience what it cannot possess, has made no attempt to limit destruction to military objectives, and has gloried in the wanton murder, starvation, and abuse of innocent civilians, women, children, elderly, and helpless, and whereas we, the residents of Concord, have a special duty imposed on us, the living heritage of this place we inhabit, and in which the great step taken in the struggle for human dignity and independence long ago has not been forgotten. Therefore, it is our sacred duty to support and defend those who, like our predecessors, are now giving their all to defend their own liberty and therefore advance for all the cause of peace with honor. Whereas Patriots Day is our special occasion to observe the blessings of liberty, humanity, and democracy that have been given to us as a special gift by virtue of belonging to the town of Concord. Now, therefore, the Concord Select Board does hereby declare that the struggle and sacrifice of the Ukrainian people shall be recognized in our observance of Patriots Day in April in the year of 2022. We invite our residents to welcome representatives of Ukraine to participate in our celebration and urge all freedom-loving people to offer aid and support to the Ukrainian people both here and in their native country. Thank you, Henry. Um, questions, uh, discussion, Linda, Matt? Thank you for the effort in putting this together. And um, I, I, I think you've um, linked what's on many people's minds to our own history. So thank you for doing that. So uh, I do like your proclamation idea much better than the original uh, proposed motion. I do too. Um, the, <laughs> I think that, you know, as a human being and as a citizen of the United States, I, you know, clearly uh, deplore, you know, the actions that have been taken to invade Ukraine. And, you know, there's, there's a lot of suffering that we um, could recognize. And I think I do think that the, one of the things that I like about the proclamation is it does tie it to a concrete action. In other words, we have this event and we're creating some thematic connection. Um, I, I'm very uncomfortable generally with us making statements or, or you know, motions uh, in response to current events, international events, because um, you know there are lots of very uh, serious problems in the world. Um, so, I mean, right now, as we speak, the most serious humanitarian crisis, um, according to the United Nations, is in Afghanistan. So, you know, do we, as a board, proclaim that we support the people of Afghanistan in order to help them get out of their crisis. And it's easy for us to make a proclamation like this for an issue such as Ukraine, where I think there's near unanimity of support within our country. But if we were also asked to make a proclamation relative to example, for example, the Israeli occupation of Palestine, or alternatively, Palestinian missile firing into Israel, how would we debate that? How would we conclude our remarks? So my problem is that as we 
let our passions sort of take control here, we can get swept into affairs that are really not Concord's affairs. I understand we have a strong tradition of freedom loving people and we are a beacon of democracy. I would say the most effective way for us to do that is to work as a town politically as a great democracy, which I believe we are. And that we support as citizens and residents, our national government and charitable organizations and others in defense of those great values. But, you know, for us as a town, I'm very concerned about the precedent because I'm unaware of a prior precedent. Well, thank you, Matt. Um, I guess those are some really good points you're making about the precedent. And I've been thinking about it. And since I've been on the board, we have signed on to other proclamations. Um, uh, the one that comes to mind is the Holocaust Day. Uh, we have definitely signed on to that every year. Now, that's not a current event, that's right. but, uh, you know, I, I agree with you that it's very hard to pick and choose and where do we draw the line. But I think um, I know we have chosen other proclamations in the past. So I guess I come down on supporting this. It, it is a tough call because I think we should probably also do one for Afghanistan or we should have already done it. I know that's we the problem. We should do one for Darfur. We should do yeah, one for Myanmar. We should no, do I one for- No, I agree with that, yeah. I don't, you know, and actually, I just if don't I know where we stop. And actually, if I could interrupt for one second, we need some more chairs in the room if there's anybody who could help with that. Thanks, Kari. Well, Thanks, Delia. We haven't had this problem in two years, yeah, so it's really. a good problem to have. <laughs> so um, I think the board has a choice now. We can either vote to have this proclamation or vote not to have it. Or if you really want, we could continue the debate at another meeting. Um, but I don't want to spend the next hour debating it. I think that would not be a good use of our time. I think we all agree that it's a very serious problem in Ukraine and we all want to help. The question is, how do we do it? Let me, add, let me just add this, um, and I don't want it to be, become a debate. Uh, of, all the, of all the questions that Matt referred to, um, this is the only one that is totally aligned with the policy of our own government and of most of the democratic governments in the world. Uh, there is virtually no controversy about this issue, issue. Unlike places like Afghanistan, where people might say that actually we were the cause of the problem there. Um, uh, this is one where um, um, I, think it, I think it's a clean issue. And as, as, as um, and I think I've said before, it's, it's, it's become so universal that it's not, it's non-controversial and it has become non-political and uh, uh, virtually uh, our entire government policy is, in, is consistent with, with our approach that we're willing to take to it. And I think we do have a special responsibility because of the heritage and history of this town. Um, and this is a unique kind of situation where we have a clear situation of an independent democratic government, um, which is um, being um, destroyed and conquered uh, without reason. Right. And I think, and, and if, if they go, you know, our other friends in Europe will be next. Okay, is there further discussion? Is everybody is everybody ready to vote on whether we're going to have this proclamation or not? Ms. Ackerman, may I make one more comment? Oh, sure. Is that allowed? Brief, briefly. Um, <coughs> I, I will be very brief. I just, your discussion, they're all very valid points, and it made me think of something someone said to me recently, which was in, in a difficult decision at a time when you're trying to figure out what to do next, and you're thinking down the line, and well, if A, then B, and then what happens? Uh, it, it can be very hard to predict. And she said, sometimes the only thing you can do is think about what is the next 
right thing to do? What is the right thing to do right now? Mm -hmm. And I feel like this is a situation where it's very clear what the right thing to do right now is. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, do I have a motion then? Is it appropriate for me to make a motion? Sure. I will move that the, uh, the board adopt the proclamation as I have read it to this meeting. Okay, is there a second? I'll second it for the sake of discussion. All right, is there any more discussion? I do believe there's a typo. Okay. Um, and I've, now I've lost it, but there's a... Can we make the um, motion subject to correcting your typo? Yes. Therefore, Matt, were you looking at... To our residents to welcome representative of Ukraine. Well, I mean, unless you just have one in mind. No, oh. I, did, I didn't have one. I will, the, the motion will include the correction of the typographical error. And, and therefore, you may want to also add an E. Well, I think that's actually the, the old fashioned appropriate. Right, but for. But we don't we need to debate. We don't, the yeah, we don't Please. need to debate that. Let's get to the <laughs> point. <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay, so we're going to correct representative to representatives, plural. All right, that motion's been seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, all opposed? I abstain. One, okay, three in favor, one abstain. Okay. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm very happy and proud that we as Concord are doing that. Thank so you. the second question, sorry, there's a second one, um, is we would like to ask you to basically ask the moderator for permission to have these handouts at town meeting. Um, they have been laid out so that they're according to the rules of town meeting handouts. She has seen them in advance. I will pass them around here. Do you want to pass them? Well, we, we, we've already had them passed yeah. around. Okay, right. great. Um, we um, we also you. had them, we also um, have them in the packet. Okay, great. So, um, yeah, if you could, I'm just sorry, I didn't want to rush you. No, that's fine. We're just, yeah. So that's probably all you need from me. I'll be quiet and let you discuss. <laughs> Madam okay. Chair, uh, this is the moderator. I have actually not seen that handout. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you had. My God. Well, um, the handout arrived today, Carmen, and um, we had a draft wording in the packet. If you want to take a look at that, if the select board votes to request that the moderator put this on the table, you know, We'll certainly um, send you the, is this a draft handout or is this the handout? It is the handout. It is the handout, if it needed edits, I think we'd be happy right. to edit. And right. I want to apologize, as Phil said earlier, I'm stepping in for someone else. And so I was, had a misunderstanding right. of the communication earlier. Right. Um, so our job, as Carmen has informed me, is to either request or not request that the moderator make an exception to the policy. The, the policy now is only town meeting materials can go on the inside handout table at town meeting. All other handouts are usually handed out right outside the door. And there are many, many um, nonprofits that have handed out literature outside when you walk into town hall. And in fact, Phil and I talked about that by telephone. So if the board now recommends that we have an exception, um, we will request that of the moderator and send you the packet that is being, the handout that is being proposed. So is there a discussion from board members? So. Linda. I feel it's um, perfectly appropriate for this to be on the tables outside of the uh, townhouse and that we do not request the um, moderator to uh, make an exception for this. And my rationale for that um, is that um, I do feel that uh, Matt's point well taken earlier, um, that the proclamation is a, um, a tool and technique that we've used in the past um, to highlight um, solidarity with certain issues that are brought before us. However, uh, the, this is a there is a fundraising component that's before us right now, and I think that there are um, multiple avenues and groups in town um, 
that are also very concerned about this issue and may also likely uh, may want to be represented uh, in terms of leaflets and so forth um, at town meeting out, outside on the tables that were appropriate for that to occur. So that's the reason for the position I, I take on this. Uh, taking nothing away for the wonderful efforts that you're doing and, 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 and what you represent, but. Uh, Phil, if you wanna have a brief, brief response to yes. that. Uh, in the light of the very elegant resolution that you've just passed, I believe it's no longer an exception at all because the rules are that any town committee can request to have material there. When we drafted it, we thought it would be an exception. I don't think it is anymore. Okay. Further discussion from the board? Yeah, I'm uncomfortable with the content, the specific content of the handout. Uh, just having had no opportunity, as much as I hear nice things about this Ukraine Forward, which actually also is the name of the Social Democratic Party in Ukraine. So it's really a little unclear whether there's an association there. No, there isn't. Okay, well, that's an unusual thing. And then that it's asking us to buy things from Amazon, you know, a specific commercial organization. Um, it just doesn't seem appropriate for the town uh, to be uh, selecting these particular organizations and seeking um, you know, to solicit contributions from our citizens to these particular things. It's fine for anybody, any citizen to do that. And I, I again, applaud efforts to help the, the citizens of Ukraine, but we as a town and to endorse an individual, you know, organization, um, you know, without going through a process, uh, you know, it's, it's not uh, consistent with our, uh, you know, approach to to conducting business as a town. So you know, I, I would say that it is not the right kind of information for the town to be distributing within town meeting. Okay. Henry, do you have co any comments you wanna make? I think I've made, made enough trouble already. Okay, <laughs> all right. Um, I think um, I agree with Linda and Matt I am not comfortable endorsing a particular um, business such as Amazon or any other, singling out any particular business or even singling out one particular nonprofit. There could be three or four different nonprofits that want to donate to Ukraine. So I think, again, we're all united that we really want to support and individually um, very impressed with this group. but. As a, as a town committee, I'm not comfortable. Town meeting is for town items that are on the warrant. So I'm very comfortable if you want to pass out your handouts right outside the door as, as the other groups do. So that's how I, how I would vote. Keep in mind that town meeting isn't until May 1st. Yes. And a lot of time will pass before then. You might get better results and faster to put that information on a placard and stand in front of the flagpole with it on Saturday mornings. Oh, we're definitely spreading the word around town in other ways. You're going to start to see the town I, painted oh, I, yellow and blue. Signs. I already <laughs> saw one. Yeah. I'm out delivering yard signs every day. Yeah. Um, can I ask one follow up question? Sure. I understand everything that you guys have been saying. Um, since you have the, made the proclamation, is there any possibility of having, I'm not sure, a statement of that proclamation at town meeting or handouts of just the statement since it's, since it's now a select board proclamation? Something that does, that does not include the fundraising aspect or Amazon or even, even ukrainefforward.org, but a copy of the proclamation. Right, I think um, the moderator is pretty clear that, you know, Things that are in the warrant are for our table. And, and when you think about it, the voters come in, we have 49 articles. There's a huge pile of handouts to read. <laughs> Frankly, I really think you'll get better pe people paying more attention when it's not on a cluttered table with all that other stuff. And if it's just 
out there by itself. Um, so I, I would not be inclined to request the moderator put it on the table. Okay. Is there further discussion? Does anyone want to make a motion this time? Okay, seeing none, but thank you for all your efforts. It's thank you very, very Thank you class. very much for discuss, taking this up tonight. We really appreciate it. Thank you. And thank you for your and support. Thank you for the proclamation. We're very grateful. Thank you very much. Can we get out of the way? All set, Phil? Yes, indeed. We are next going to move on to endorse the historic commission letter concerning Battle Road. So I see we have uh, Melissa and Nancy here. Um, is anyone else here if you want to come up? And is there anybody else here who's here to discuss uh, the Battle Road? Uh, the, so we talked about this last week. And the only thing I was confused about was it looks like you have written a beautiful letter. And whether you want the select board to write our own letter, sign on to your letter, or, or what exactly you're looking for now, from it, us. Is it possible you can simply sign on and endorse the letter so that we can say that at, uh, officially at, at uh, the Selectman's meeting on April 4th that you voted to support our letter or our position? Then we can, you know, if I'm, I'm prepared tomorrow to send out an um, email to the folks at the Federal Highways and Mass Department Transportation that you have done so. And then I have some follow-up questions for them. But it would help us. Okay, it's certainly possible. Um, I just wanted to get clear what you were asking us to do. It's very simple. Seems simpler. <laughs> great. <laughs> okay, great. Uh, any discussion? I heartily support it. I agree. I'll use that. All right. Do we? That was a great letter. It was really a really good letter. Thank you, Nancy. Not I'd strong, like to take not, all the credit. Not but... strong enough. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Why don't you come to the next meeting? You know how hard it is to, to deal with these government people. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Do I have a motion? Now? Sure. Move to endorse the Historical Commission letter as printed in the packet for this meeting. March 28th. Of, 2022. Oh, dated, letter dated March 28th, 2022, right as right. printed in the packet for this meeting. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, great. So do you want me to physically sign that letter? Um, I don't think that's necessary. I think we can just use okay. your, your, the, this, this will be official. Okay. Thank you very There's much. There's anything else you need, let us know. Thank, Thank you. you for all your efforts on Thank this. Thank you very much. We're not okay. done. This is a perennial <laughs> issue. Okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm sure you'll keep us posted. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. We are next going to have an update from our town clerk. Kari Tari on the board and committee database. Welcome, Kari. Thank you. And um, just to remind the board what this is all about, um, we have many volunteers in town. We have 60 something committees, and it's very hard to track with the system that we've had in the past. Who's volunteered? How long ago did they volunteer? Which committees do they want to be on? who's on the committees now, when are their terms up. And so we've been working on a new system. And Kari is here to give us an update on that new system. Yes, thank you. Um, we're calling it an interim solution okay. because we had hoped for a web-based solution, which would have really been ideal. Um, something that works with Civic Plus and we believed that there was a module that, that could do this, and it turns out that it's under development. So we're gonna wait a little while, but in the meantime, uh, we need to make sure that our, our data is well organized, that we can keep the uh, web pages up to date with information, that we can keep you up to date with uh, appointment information, <clears throat> and also when we have volunteers, and we have many volunteers, Oh, and um, the expiration terms and the length of terms, those are all things that we've somewhat lost track of because we've been using a, a Microsoft Access database like a spreadsheet. And so that's, that's the history. We're moving forward from that. 
and all the data isn't isn't um, always entered accurately. Boards and committees are referred to in a lot of different ways. And so what we've done is we've, we've uh, partnered with a vendor who has worked with other town clerks in Massachusetts to, <clears throat> excuse me, to develop a database. And they have most of the pieces there, but we really want to refine them for what you want and what we want to have on the web page. And so it's it's a Microsoft Access database, but the vendor is there. The vendor is working with us, is creating the reports that we need, um, and we are scrubbing the data. We're making sure that the committees have the same reference information. We're looking at the committee charges to make sure that we have the right terms. We're looking at the, um, the seats so that we can make sure that we have staggered terms and and some of those things have just fallen off and and the way it happens so easily is when you have a vacancy and you don't realize that it's not a three-year vacancy it's a two-year vacancy then then things just are out of balance so the way we're going to do this is the robin in in the uh select board office in your office takes in the volunteer information. So she is updating that information in the database and forwarding the appointment information to you, the nomination and appointment information. And then once a member is appointed, the town clerk's office gets the information. We send out the appointment letter, notifying them that you've appointed them and letting them know that they now need to take the oath of office. And when they come in, then we also give them the committee handbook and the, uh, a memo that tells them what acknowledgements and online training they need to do. So it, it just made sense that, that where people are coming in, they're coming to the select board office to, to um, express their interest in serving on a committee or they're doing it electronically. But once they've been appointed, it becomes a, a part of our routine to make sure that we can track the information so that everyone has a chance to comply. Okay, thank you. So I have some questions. So are you, did you say that this is up and running now or not yet? It is, it's up and running now. And now we're just working with the data. Okay, so let's say, what is, so there are a number of people who have applied in the past six months we have on the back of our agenda, borrow your agenda for a second. Yes, a number of vacancies that we list on every agenda. So for all of those volunteer cards, which we call green cards, are you saying that Robin is now taking in that information? That information has, has always been entered from the select board office. So it's being entered, it's how we extract the data so that we can have a report that combines what's your first interest, second interest, and third interest. Great, in that's, that's where I'm getting to. So that report, can that be circulated to the select board and to the committee chairs? Because they are really asking for this. Yes. They are looking to fill their vacancies and they desperately need that report. Okay. Is there actually a report needed or is it accessible for search for searching? It is right now because it's an access database. It's not something that we can share easily or at all. We can share reports. We can we can. So we must ask yeah. and then receive. Well, well, no, what I'm saying is how about in the next few months, can we get, let's say, a weekly or at least a monthly report? Because I've had a number of inquiries for these vacancies, um, people who have applied as far back as September that the chairs have not, they don't know these people have applied. So, Terry, I'm I, I hear your point, and yeah, it's, a, it's a source of anxiety for all of us. Yes. <laughs> it's been a problem all year. Yeah. So um, I'm wondering if it might be helpful if we got that report first, just to see the status of it. And the reason I'm asking that is um, 
at one point when we talked about this in the past, we we or had some interview assignments. Mm -hmm. And when we followed through with those with potential candidates, in some cases, in the course of that conversation, the candidate, the person, uh, volunteer applicant, um, <coughs> would have either changed their mind about the committees that they listed, or in fact, in the course of the conversation, we realized that they would be a terrific match for X committee. Mm -hmm. And that information was fed to the town manager's office with the idea that it was going to go on some kind of spreadsheet and then also activate a system where if I had recommended somebody now for the Board of Health, for example, that that card would have gotten sent out to the, the chair and the liaison. So we knew that there was some act activity there. And so, right, but the, that's a very good example. That committee chair this is not, I didn't even know there was five people who had volunteered for two vacancies, but they didn't know that. So um, I think we could do it the way Linda's suggesting if you want. I think the thing is we need to get that report out as soon as possible if there's any way to get it out soon um, to us. And then also maybe a week later or two weeks later to the committee's chairs. I don't know how it got there, but I know at one time um, there was um, the records had a, some narrative information that was provided by the uh, by the uh, people who were filling out the form, and it would it would have say more about them if they chose to say it than just their first, second, and third choice. Because when you're making those choices, you'd like to know something about them, what their qualifications were, what they did. You know what skills they had, and some people are actually willing to tell you things like that. It is. <laughs> and we can capture that information. And, uh, although what it turns out is, the more qualified they are, the less they care to say about it. So, um, <laughs> but anyway, it's it would be good to do whatever's uh, would help in stimulating a greater um, uh, exposition on the part of the uh, the candidates instead of bare bones set of choices and that would be helpful in determining that somebody who had applied to be on the natural resources commission but really mm -hmm. had a love of pavement or something like mm -hmm. that and really ought to go with the public works and when you're looking for them we might want to make the choices for them and we really appreciate you working on this this is um uh, something that's been broken and we really appreciate you helping to get it fixed well it's it's a great team effort and with the everyone who's working on it yeah. board office so, right yes mm -hmm. another thing that actually might be helpful is it, it, along the same lines uh, i've been begging for this for a long time is to have a compilation mm -hmm. of the charges the current charges for all the committees because many of us have no no longer remember what these committees were supposed to do and <clears throat> mm -hmm. um you know and what is on the town website is kind of haphazard in that regard yeah. right <clears throat> and related to that well car you mentioned that this system will help keep the web pages up to date um well, what did you mean by that it will help us keep the web pages up to date if when when there is a web interface that will be automatic it's not there yet oh, so okay. we are we will manually be entering it but but having working more closely with the data will allow it to be in our minds more and, and right. allow us to get it there but i guess so you'll be manually entering um the new the new committee members and their, their term dates, is that what you're saying? On the web pages? Yeah. Yes. Oh, okay. Uh, yes. The other, that would be a huge help. The other thing would be, do you have the committee charge for each committee be on its web page? Mm -hmm. and, and some of the committees don't have any web pages right now. And I know you're not in charge of all of this, but I'm just, since you brought it up, <laughs> just saying we we have a few broken links in here um for example um i was at 
the chair's breakfast recently, and I was at a coffee recently, and a lot of times we're saying, wow, you guys are a talented group. Why don't some of you apply? And the first question I get is, what can I apply for? What do these committees do? Where do I find out about it? We need to have that available because we do have a lot of talented people and we don't want to lose them. Absolutely. We can do that. Thanks. Yes. Great. Matt, did you have anything to add? No, I mean, I, I, I mean, it does look like Civic Plus has some other tools, this like low code environment, not Pacific <laughs> Optimize. And, you know, I, I don't know if you looked at all that oh, stuff. Yes. Well, we looked at Civic Clerk and we had a sales team do a Zoom presentation for us, and it became very clear that they did not actually have the product okay. working yet. <laughs> so we thought, okay, we need something now. So we're eager for that to be done, but it, it was clear to us that it wasn't there. Uh, since I've yeah. spent 35 years working for software companies, I empathize. <laughs> <laughs> So we really appreciate you and everyone else taking the initiative to help fix this. I think we really owe it to our volunteers to give them the information and let them come forward. So does anyone else have any questions, comments? You do a terrific job. You really do. <laughs> okay, thank you, Kari. Okay, we are going to move on to our town meeting items. So the way that I've put this together on the agenda is um, first I've put on the ones that I think will be very short and then we're going to do the Community Preservation Committee which we haven't had a chance to do that do yet Then we're going to go back to some articles that we started before and haven't finished. Um, there will be time for public comment at various points. And I want to remind the board that for each article, we have three choices tonight. We can recommend a for affirmative action. We can recommend no action. Or we can recommend that we're going to report a town meeting. That will appear in the Finance Committee book. And then we will keep discussing our position over the next few weeks. And we will have to take a position by May 1st. Do we Hopefully actually need a vote to report a town meeting, or we just simply don't vote? Um, I guess I mean, we simply default. don't. We, we can simply decide, yeah. yeah, we don't have to vote that. But those are our three choices. Okay. Affirmative action, no action, or report a town meeting. Sure. So starting with Article 18, I am going to recommend that we report a town meeting. And the reason is that the Finance Committee has a guideline. The School Committee right now is $312,000 above the guideline. They have not agreed, and they are meeting to discuss it on April 7th. And I suggest that we wait until that discussion happens before we try to chime in on that. But if anyone disagrees, please speak I, up I now. I think that sounds reasonable. Yep, as correct. long as there actually are discussions, I had heard that perhaps there weren't discussions planned. Right, but there is a meeting schedule for this okay. Thursday. Yeah. And that is the main topic of the okay. meeting. Okay. Well, if there are no discussions and there is no change, you well, know then, what, then you there know would be a reason to have a vote. You know what our recommendation right. would be. Right. Okay. Well, no, if, well, the, if actually, that happens, then we still need, we after this, this meeting, we're going to have to discuss what our position is. Whether, you know, if they agree, then we'll discuss it. If they don't agree, we'll discuss it. We have to have a position, but we don't have one right now. And if, and if we're delayed in um, stating our position, it may or may not make the FinCom book. Well, it won't. Anything, it won't. The yeah. FinCom book deadline is the 6th. So anything we don't do tonight, the FinCom book will say report it to me. Okay. Article 31. I think should be pretty quick. Yeah. Does anyone have anything they want to discuss about Article 31, additional dwelling unit? It is on the consent calendar, I believe. So I seem to recall that was revised, right? The, or was the wording revised? No, I think that's... They 30. determined they didn't need to revise the wording? 
That's 32 and 35. The additional dwelling unit where they grandfathered the units? That, Madam Chair, I can help with that. This is the okay. moderator. Uh, yes, we did revise the language of that to um, address the uh, potential problem of opening the door too wide there. Right. Uh, and um, uh, the language now, I'm just looking for it so I can read it to you. Um, uh, basically, we just made it clear that... Uh, uh, the intent is that there will be an exception for uh, uh, for uh, ADUs that were permitted and recorded uh, prior to the date when the uh, uh, dimensional uh, changes were made. So, uh, which might not qualify under the uh, current uh, dimensions in the uh, bylaw so long as the unit complies with the previously recorded um, ADU. So in other words, it can't be made any bigger. And um, I'm still just looking for the language, apologies. I will... Um... Armin, this is Elizabeth, if you'd like me to read it. Oh, thank you, Elizabeth. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. Um, the motion will be amended um, to be uh, Ms. Ferguson moves that the town take affirmative action on Article 31 as printed in the ward warrant, adding the sentence at the end, provided that the additional. Um, oh, hang on one second. Oh, I'm see, I'm reading the wrong one too now. Um, yep. All right. <laughs> no, no, I, I have it. Hang on two seconds. Um, it is with the added sentence, and I have my handout. Um, and the planning board will be reviewing this um, tomorrow night. With the added sentence, provided that the dimensions of the additional dwelling unit conform to the dimensional requirements in the recorded special permit. There we go. Okay, thank you, Elizabeth. You're welcome. Are there questions or discussion from the select board on this article. Okay, are we ready for a motion? A move to recommend affirmative action on article 31 as amended and presented in this meeting. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, we will go on to article 34. Are there Select board questions or discussion on Article 34. All right, seeing none, we're ready for a motion on Article 34. Move to recommend affirmative action on Article 34 as printed in the warrant. Is there a second? Second. Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, Article 34 passes affirmative action. And then we have Article 35. Um, is Karen um, Judanus with us? Yes, I am. I'm on the phone. Okay, thank you, Karen. I see in our packet that we have a few updated slides. Um, I only included in the packet the slides that were updated. So I think you've updated these in, in order to answer the questions that were raised at the public hearing. Is that correct? That is correct, yes. All right. Does anyone have any questions or discussion um, on the select board concerning Article 35? Yes. Has the planning board deliberated on this article? I am not aware that they have. Okay. Um, Carmen, can you remind me, is this article on the consent calendar? It is not, Madam Chair. And the planning board does need to uh, give it a hearing. Uh, well, it was heard at the hearings, was it, was it not? It was heard at the hearing. That's why I was curious yeah. whether the planning board had expressed their views. Right. Yeah. As long as the planning board has had a hearing on it, but they do have to make a report to town meeting uh, expressing their view uh, I'm sure Elizabeth can tell us what the plan is there. 
Um, the planning board will be taking up all of the articles they're required to make a recommendation to at their meeting tomorrow night. Okay. okay. Well, then, think we, they should make their recommendations before we do. Well, I'm prepared <clears throat> to make a recommendation for, um, I mean, but I also understand if the rest of the board would like to defer, that would be our usual process. Yeah. I think there were a few others that we were prepared to vote on. Then we decided to wait until the yeah um, the board in question um, made its decision. That's so, fine with me. Uh, do you do you guys want to report a town meeting then, or does anyone want to make a motion? For I'd that? like, particularly on this one, I would like to hear the planning board's deliberation. Okay. okay, let's do that. Let's do that. So, Article Thirty Five will say report a town meeting, as will Article 18. Okay, now we are on to Article 26, Community Preservation Committee. And um, Diane Proctor, if you would like to come up, and anybody else who is involved in um, what I'm going to do for this Article 26. I am going to call through each letter. It's divided into sections from A through K. And I'm going to see if we have any questions. Uh, for example, does anyone have any questions for A, uh, Regional Housing Services Office? OK, how about B, home, Concord Home for the Aged? Uh, C, Trustees of Reservations, Old Mance. D, Wright Tavern Legacy. E, Concord Free Public Library Oral History Preservation Project. I would just say that I'm especially enthusiastic about that one. Okay. I am as well. Yeah. <laughs> Have they taken your oral history yet? No, I, I don't think I qualify. But we'll get yours, Henry. <laughs> you you oh, might. I've already done. <laughs> you might qualify, Henry. Okay. Just, um, by, just by seniority. <laughs> no, not just by, by seniority. But okay, uh, to Asabit River Bluff. I have some questions on that one. So let's hold on that one. Uh, G, Junction Village Open Space. H, Bruce Freeman Rail Trail. I have a question on that one. Okay, I, Asabit River Pedestrian Bridge. Okay, I have a question on that one. And um, <laughs> J, Recreation Facility Strategic Plan. K, Staff and Technical Support. So, Board members, you, no one has questions on any of these items except me. Is that well? I mean, I've expressed opinions and and had questions at the hearing, so mm -hmm. I feel like those have been, you know, discussed, um, except for F. Okay, let's take a brief question on H and I. Then my question on the H Bruce Freeman Rail Trail: What will happen if? This is not funded. I presume if this, uh, Diane Proctor, 57 Sudbury Road, chair of the, of the CPC. Um, I presume if this were not to be funded, uh, that what would happen is that we would just not have the kind of safety precautions that they hope to establish on that trail. Okay. That's what it's for, for safety? It's mostly for safety, I mean, it's, it's yes. Could Madam Chair, this is Marsha Rasmussen. I'm sorry? Any particular locations? Uh, Marsha, do you have the paper? Marsha? Uh, no, it wasn't just for safety. It wasn't just for safety. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, this is a small amount of money. It's $30,000 that we are seeking for any additional landscaping, for benches, for some signage. Um, one of the projects that has been identified is the um, a connection to the uh, prison cemetery, the Department of Corrections prison cemetery. And so we're planning to do an interpretive panel and um, hiring the consultant to help us with that design and so forth. So this small amount of funding is, is anticipated to provide some amenities along the rail trail that are currently not available. 
Okay. Which I understood in their presentation to enhance the safety for people, benches and things for, for people walking the trail and spending time there. All right. Thank you, Marcia. And another question that maybe Marcia can answer or perhaps someone else on I, the pedestrian bridge, um, we brought up at a previous select board meeting that uh, we're really in favor of this project, but the cost keeps going up. And has any um, has anyone approached the businesses um, in West Concord or on Baker Ave to see if possibly they would donate toward this effort? Marcia has to take that that question. <laughs> and, and I'm going to turn it over to Elizabeth Hughes, who has been the project lead on this this aspect. Okay, Elizabeth. Uh, thank you. So um, for this uh, design phase. Um, and the permitting and the engineering, uh, we have not uh, approached businesses uh, at this point. Um, the, there will definitely have to be um, some you know, major fundraising and um, approaching businesses for the construction side of things. Um, working to get the project onto the state transportation improvement program, similar to how the Bruce Freeman Rail Trail was funded. Um, but there will be um, town match required under that, as well as, um, as you're seeing with the Bruce Freeman Rail Trail, there may be certain enhancements um, that won't be funded through the state transportation improvement program through Mass MassDOT. Um, the cost side of things, um, because we want to get this on the state transportation improvement program and having to go through the whole mass DOT um, design and permitting, um, when this does go to construction, it will have to be under a um, pre prevailing wage and public bid, which adds approximately 40% uh, percent to the cost of the project. So uh, it's not um, necessarily the cost of this project is going up solely because of the bridge we're building, but because of the process we're going through and the requirements of the state and the funding and public bid process and prevailing wage requirements for any t use of federal and state funds. So but, if I heard you right, Elizabeth, you're saying that on the, uh, in the TIP DOT program, even if we were successful, we would be required to have a town match for that, and the businesses might commun um, contribute contribute that um, toward that town match. Is that what you're saying? Definitely. Okay. Okay. Thank you. All right. What I think we should do is. Um, Madam Chairman, I believe this is a project that's been just for people who don't know. This project has been on the um, on on the planning books for for at least five years. Yes, it's a wonderful project. Yes, yes. It really connects West Concord with uh, an important service center in Concord. Right. Okay, so before we get on to Assabet River Bluff, which I think there might be quite a bit of discussion, I just want to see, are there any more questions from the people in the room here or on Zoom about any other item on the Community Preservation Committee uh, Article 26. Okay, I don't see any questions. All right. So what is the pleasure of the board? Do you want to take position on Article 26 now? Or do you want to discuss the Assabet River Article 25 and then take position on this one? Mm -hmm. Which way do you guys want to do it? I, I think that the only issue we had was not the expenditure of the, the money or the project itself, but the amount of housing that would be provided on it. Right. And that's probably not in the control of the community preservation people. Okay. That's a matter of the whatever the our housing entity is going to be, okay. how they fund it. All right. So I actually would like to be able to agree, and I'm not sure whether I can. <laughs> so what, why I, I have actually proposed an a approach, you know, that would, um, 
you know, get my vote, which would be to increase the number of housing units and, um, and perhaps increase a little bit the allocation of land. I had originally proposed moving from an acre to an acre and a half. I think even an acre and a quarter would be sufficient if you were just going to add a duplex and a triplex to get a total of seven units. But um, I, I wondered whether the allocation of funds between open space and community housing would need to be adjusted to reflect that greater allocation of, of land. I, I don't know that that's really necessary. I think that the MOU can decide how much, many dollars it takes to pay for whatever parcel plus the, the duplex it takes. So, you know, either we consider affordable housing to be a use that, you know, gets a, a subsidized value of the land, or we just increase the allocation to community housing of the million dollars, but still leave it at a million dollars. You know, it, it, we could just say, okay, more of the money is going towards community housing. So therefore, you know, but it doesn't really matter. It's all the same money going to the same project. I think it's very it, what really matters is the memorandum of understanding and what it says about how much of the land goes to community housing and how many units should be provided on that plot. And of course, no additional units have been funded to go on that plot. So we don't, you know, actually, we're not even looking at affordable housing as it stands, but we rather land that's- abstract it's, promise. I think it's more, it's kind of <laughs> yeah. like tax accounting. It has very little to do with reality. Well, okay. I don't know. It may, it has something to do with reality. All right, um, Linda and then I, Diane. I, I do believe though what, that Stuart well, Saginaw, I mean, just to respond, Stuart Saginaw, who is the one who manages the CPC on a state level, I believe we've been informed and I can check this again, but my understanding from him is that we need to present to the town a very bright and clear line as to where that division would take place on a map um, and Absolutely. And so the so, MOU reflects that, right? So that that is a clear document that describes those terms. And that has very little to do with how we parcel up the money, I wouldn't think. Okay, Linda? I mean, we could, could, uh, we could allocate all of the money for conservation and then still build housing on part of it. Okay, I think uh, Linda is our um, liaison. Yeah, so I was just going to suggest it sounds like we've already moved into uh, the need to uh, talk about Article 26 yes. before we. Um, no, 25. 25. 25, sorry. Right, before, right. Yeah. And then we'll go back and, yeah. and take yeah. it. Right, right. Um, do you have any um, comments about, you know, you've observed all the CPC meetings and. So, you know, um, I'm certainly simpatico with Matt in terms of always trying to maximize the number of affordable housing units that we can benefit from uh, on the limited opportunities that the town has uh, to, to, to address that. In this case, however, we have had multiple and multiple entities um, debating this over a long period of time, and all of the integral pieces have had to work together uh, to come to the point where we are with this agreement. And um, a, a lot of thought has gone into this. Um, there have been a lot of cross conversations between um, different groups. Um, and I think we just received a, a, a summary outline um, just before the meeting started um, that tries to capture all of that. Is, clearly and as plainly as possible, as well as to address some of the um, questions as well as um, concerns that have come up. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think originally uh, we were talking about more um, housing, uh, affordable housing units on that property. And um, again, <laughs> over the course of multiple conversations, um, we tried to compromise and come to a place where we could meet needs across the board. And in this case, you know, I think this is, we're setting new territory here in, in many ways in terms of trying to meet dual um, town goals, both for open space and for housing, um, as well as bring together multiple sources of funding and 
obviously conversations with the neighborhood and others who are going to be, uh, and there's some unique fundraising that's going on to also contribute to this. So um, I, I, again, I'm sympathetic to um, the, the trying to always find opportunity but, but, for but since all the money is coming from the same place that is the whole million dollars is coming from the cpa with cpa money well, how that's, it's, that's how not it, correct that, that i'm glad you well, brought but that's that up. all we're talking about now is the cpa allocation well actually i i agree with linda i think we, i think we're going to go back to the cpc allocation in a minute we we're, we're now talking about article 25 itself um sorry about the confusion um, so I would like to clarify some of the numbers because I'm a little bit confused. Um, I see that one million is proposed to come from the CPC, yes, and we can talk about how it's allocated. I see you have an allocation in here, and maybe we'll propose a change. I don't know, but what I don't understand is how much is coming from the town and how much from the fundraising groups because i'm i'm looking at the mou and i'm not coming up with the um i'm a little confused looking at the numbers oh, thank you terry i think there are people here um in the audience who can speak to that right who would um, who would like to answer that so um is that Lisa? Oh, yes. okay Hi, Lee. Thank you for joining us. Good evening. Lee Smith, 1836 Main Street. I'm the chair of the CHDC. Thank you. So let me see if I have this right. Um, it looks to me like the... Go ahead. It looks to me from the MOU, and just stop me when I get it wrong, that CPC would give 700000 for the open space, and then... The Concord Municipal Affordable Housing Trust would give 650000 for housing, and the CPC another 300000 for housing. Is that correct? Sounds right. OK, because when I add those three numbers, I'm getting 1650000 and I had heard that it was $1 million total. So I was just trying to, so it's $1 million from CPC and 650000 besides that. And then if we get a grant, it would reduce our contribution. No? OK. So sorry, just trying to understand this here. As you can see, there's a lot of moving pieces. There's a lot of entities who are okay. helping fund the acquisition of, of this project. Mm -hmm. um, in addition, we've got um, $50,000 pledged from the Concord Housing Foundation. So that's another source of funds. But as to the 500, I believe it's presented as a contingent right. request. Um, grants have been applied for, and if, the, if those come in at full funding, then that would reduce the amount that we were looking from the town. Right, that's what I meant, yep. yeah. Okay, but I, I had forgotten about the Housing Foundation, thank you, okay? And then if I could just add, in addition to all that, the open space and conservation groups are well on their way to privately coming up with uh, 1.2 million dollars for the acquisition and I believe as of today they're in the range of eight hundred thousand dollars already pledged right the brochures are beautiful yes it's fantastic yep. okay and then an another oh Krista did you want to add something thanks um Krista Collins 55 Highland Street and, and land protection director for Sunbury Valley Trust. um can you just oh. yeah so <laughs> do you want me to say that again right up. thank you <laughs> um so um I just wanted to make make clear that the grant uh, is is strictly for the open space portion of the purchase so that and because it's a reimbursable grant the town has to allocate 100 percent of the funds and spend 100 percent of the funds to show the state that they the canceled check and then be reimbursed through okay. the grant so. thank you so another number that i'm confused about um because we don't have a number yet is the cost per unit and i know that we don't know any of that yet but what I'm frustrated by, honestly, is there should be some way to do an estimate. Can we get any kind of a ballpark estimate? Um, 
so that we have an idea be for the voters before they vote? Unfortunately not. Um, what needs to be understood about this project is we it's taken us approximately six months just to get to this point where we've just signed a purchase and sale agreement just a few weeks ago. So if we're successful at town meeting and we're able to acquire the property, including the fundraising, then we would then embark on the planning and development exercise where we would take the time we need to figure out what's the best part of the site to use? Where does the septic need to go? What does the massing look like? Is it a single family in a duplex? Is it modular construction? Is it Habitat for Humanity? Is it a private nonprofit developer? All things that we just haven't gotten to yet just because of the um, time constraints associated with this project, which I'll add is primarily driven by the fact that this property is privately owned and was poised to go on sale to the open market. Right. And the owners very generously offered it to the town first. And we've been, they've been extremely patient with us to get to this point and then agreeing to wait until after town right. meeting to determine whether we can move forward. And if not, the deposit funds are going to be returned to those right. who, who contributed to them. So there just hasn't been enough time to create a viable development project to even Oh, Start right. I'm not asking what, for that. Right. I understand what, that. But what, I guess what the money looks like. Do you have, for example, an estimate um, based on, I'm not going to remember the exact number, 940 Main Street, something like that, the, <clears throat> where the habit, habitat is building now? Is there, a, you know, a cost per square foot that they're using that we could just use as an estimate? Is there anything like that? Does, does Liz know that? Cost per square foot? That's that that project is being developed by Habitat for Humanity. Right. CHTC acquired that land with the house from. <laughs> Sorry, it's so crowded in here. Let me, <laughs> Thank let me you. get up, Liz. Why don't you sit over here? No, Liz, oh, on my agenda. So hi, I'm Liz Rust, um, 201 Commonwealth Avenue. Um, the, the different models that Lee mentioned are very different in terms of cost. The habitat model, the town basically paid um, just for the sewer connection, and habitat really picked up all those other costs, and most of it's volunteer labor. Right. They have some costs. Modular would be a whole different subset, and then um, just regular stick build. So any of the even ballpark numbers would just be so different um, that... Um, you really need to go through the more planning process to get at what you're looking at. Okay, could, it makes could, it very difficult for voters. If I could just add on yeah. to that. You know, we're also talking about a development project that probably won't start within less than two years, just to pick a number. So any number that we might throw out today, especially in the extremely uh, high cost of construction as we know it today, is, we can't, it can't necessarily be relied upon for a project two years down the road. So okay. We, and my last question is maybe for Delia, um, if she's, oh, Delia's here, hi. Um, do the trails, just to make it real difficult down there, right? Sorry about that. Um, do the trails um, actually connect to existing town trails, or do we have a plan for them to connect? Uh, thank you, Delia K, Natural Resources Director. Uh, there are existing trails um, on the property. There is one that um, has the, the sort of main loop trail does have three entrances that come off the Bruce Freeman Rail Trail. And the, the goal is to have an ADA compliant loop trail that comes off two, ideally two points of the Bruce Freeman um to provide that ada compliant loop trail so yes right now i mean those those trails are are on private property the um, property owners have allowed the townspeople to use those trails those will all go away if the town is not able to work with this partnership of housing and and uh, land trust to acquire uh, the land what about from pine street would it, would it be able to connect over there so there's the possibility of, of connections, but those would entail um, agreements with uh, private property owners. Okay. Okay. All right. Other questions from board members on Article 25? Um, I had a question, which was, 
with the grant for the open space, if that grant comes through, what happens to the funds? To the grant funds? Yeah. Do they just go back to open space funds for future CPC grants? I mean, clearly we've allocated all the funds at town meeting if, if we go forward with this. So the grant would then refund some of that, but that we've already spent the money, if you will. So the, the monies would be, the monies that are being requested from CPA funds would be allocated. If the fund, if the grant was obtained, that would release the burden on the town um, borrowing. So those funds we would pay, as Krista said, it's a reimbursable grant. So we have to have the money to pay the seller in July. Um, when the town is reimbursed, that money would go back into the town account. Right, but again, so we we have a CPC allocation, a grand total of, you know, uh, 1.8 mil. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now it sounds like we get a $500,000 refund against our 1.8 mil. I assume that that 500,000 would then be back in the open space account, just as we already had an open space prior year fund balance. <laughs> for future fund years for CPC, or is it, does it go somewhere else? Carrie, do you want to take that? So my understanding is that the grants and the donations from private property owners, that's in the same category. That's $1.2 million. So if the grant is received, it reduces the need for private donations. Oh, oh. oh that's different. Right. Am well, I so that means that private donors would net <laughs> only put up seven hundred thousand. Yeah, that, um, that's not okay. No, that's so <laughs> it, it's very complicated yeah. because essentially with the private fundraising, we're hedging our bets. So yes, there there needs to be between the grant and the private fundraising a total of one point two million. Um, we're I don't want to steal Polly's thunder, Polly. <laughs> How much have we raised, Polly? <laughs> Nine. Okay. As of today, we've raised eight hundred and ninety-seven thousand oh. dollars from incredibly generous people who support this project. So Fantastic. that's a really important thing to keep in mind. Wow. So, um, so if we now, if we rate, if we let's say we we stop at nine hundred thousand, and then we get the five hundred thousand dollar grant, we'll have ex exceeded the one point two million. Right. So some of that excess. Could um, would well so there's the five hundred thousand that that has to be fronted from bonding so that would go away and then there would be an excess of a couple hundred thousand dollars that we could decide to put in a permanent stewardship endowment for the property we could put it towards creating the all persons trail or or conceivably it could reimburse some of the community preservation funds. Okay, so that hasn't been decided. So um, I thought the grant would reimburse. The 1.65 million that the town was the putting town. in, but that's yeah. not correct. Okay, <clears throat> it it might reimburse part of it, but none of it's been decided. It's, it's the maximum that the town would have if we didn't raise another dollar. Now mm -hmm. the maximum that would come from the town would be nine hundred thousand, seven hundred from the um, CPA and a two hundred dollar gap that would have to come from the bonding and for the this is for the open space for the open yeah. space <laughs> for the open space for this for the open space right all right well anyway i suggest that you know when this goes to town meeting that there be some kind of one page chart that because i tried to sort through all this and i'm yes. still and, not totally... and we do expect that we'll hear about one of the grants by town meeting right. so that's going to make it a lot easier to talk about so right um okay Carrie, did you want to add? Well, I, I'm, I'm just wondering. There is a chart on page three of the handout that we received. Which handout? The one that came <laughs> at 5:59 p.m. Right, right. And, that's part of the one. And that's... I'm assuming this, this is an accurate chart because we just received it. But it doesn't it show, doesn't the, show grant. the reimbursed grant. So it, it the does it, on the last row it says land campaign donations and grants okay so, so the, okay the, the reason for that is because when we put this table together and it is still accurate we don't know what the fundraising is going to sure where that's going to land 
but you know, we had to put in the land and water conservation fund application in January. That was put in for five hundred thousand dollars. Recognize and as well as the borrowing article for twenty five. That's also for five hundred thousand. If we don't get the grant, or even if we do, we still need to pay the seller all the money that you know the the, the two point eight million that is the acquisition cost. And that unknown will continue to be what the fundraising amount is. Right. I, so I, I understand this page finally okay. now. Yeah, okay. okay. Linda. Um, I understand the, the, uh, the numbers as described. I guess the only um, thing that I do have a question about is the answer about should, there, should the fund, your fundraising goal be met or be just under? And in the meantime, the town appropriated at town meeting the 500k it's been fronted to complete the purchase it seems to me that any um if if the town had any money that's um not reversed uh, uh, reimbursed uh, that was raised uh, should that should be returned to the town from that 500,000 that was allocated by the town not to cpc that i heard somebody say I mean, that yes, seems the, to the, be yeah, the, the 500. And then if there is anything beyond, beyond that, that, it could go back to CPC, because if we got the okay. grant right now, we would we would we would we would have a surplus even even beyond the 500,000. But I think we understand that we have to describe the surplus scenario and where that money goes um, in that event. I think when we put this together, we were hoping to hit the goals, but now it seems like maybe we're going to surpass some of the goals. And so that's a that's different problem excellent. set. Yeah. That's really excellent. Right. I thought a minute ago you, were, you said, well, maybe we'll do some trail development or some sewage. Or, so that would be a question whether you do that or you send the money back to the town or whatever. So, yeah, um, that question will come up. Thank you. But some clarity about the f first amount of um, overage once uh, the uh, frontage money is reimbursed yeah. should clearly go to the town for the 500 appropriation in the warrant. And if that's clear, then you don't want to muddy the waters beyond that, I guess. Yeah. And I think we tried to say that in the description of Article 25, where it talks about, um, I think the last sentence of that description of the article um, says that uh, um, the town has partnered with CLCT and SVT to raise the additional funding needed to complete the purchase of the conservation land and the $500,000 of debt service may be reduced to the extent that private fundraising ex exceeds its goal. So that was the intention of, of that, and we can we can clarify that a little bit better because I don't think that that point is is getting across clearly. Right, I think that's why I got confused. That I thought if the grant came in, the whole five hundred thousand would go back to the town. I didn't understand it was combined with the fundraising in this chart. So yeah, okay, great. Good to have the conversation. <laughs> and some of that confusion comes because of where the num how the numbers were described in the original MOU that was executed. Mm -hmm. So we may want to go back and look at the MOU. I don't know. Mm -hmm. It's okay. just in terms of how those numbers are described and allocated. Okay. Excellent. That, that's where some of the confusion is coming Right, from. but excellent fundraising job. Good problem to have, right? Additional questions from board members? Well, I guess I could now just uh, describe my position and yep. why I came to it. So, uh, first of all, in November 22nd, uh, the minutes that we, executive session minutes that we just made public, um, you know, we were presented with this opportunity. Um, and as it was described at that time, you know, there was this uh, cooperative option of preserving open space for the majority of the parcel and then uh, developing affordable housing. And we looked at, uh, you know, pro forma examples of, you know, 11 units, for example, um, and also looked at the yield options for uh, subdivision as well as uh, for uh, PRD options. And, um, you know, I think that the opportunity looked interesting at that time, even though it did seem right from the beginning that the funds 
uh, to actually build the affordable housing um, just weren't readily available. Um, and, and so uh, I think we at that time authorized a 5% deposit um, so that uh, some work could be done to come up with an agreement. So then when the agreement uh, came out, uh, I think in January, I think ever since then, any time you know, that we have had a chance to discuss it, I mean, I was extremely disappointed from the very beginning that it was just five units that were um, envisaged under that memorandum of understanding. And I don't believe that the select board has really been a party uh, to the negotiation of those terms. And, you know, maybe that's appropriate. But what I can say is that this is an exceptional site for housing, um, as we noted at that time. It, of course, also has a tremendous open space opportunities, but those are, I think, um, you know, more than amply uh, provided for uh, in the, the proposal that is done here. But meanwhile, you know, we have a housing crisis in Massachusetts. And while we've had tremendous efforts from many groups, including many people in this room, to increase our affordable housing, we really have not succeeded in fact, you know, it's somewhat ironic, but in the memo, it does point out we are at a risk of a 40B development right now. And that's because we don't necessarily, we're not 100% sure yet, have our 10% of affordable housing. And again, that's in spite of a lot of efforts. Um, and we also have in front of us the uh, MBTA communities legislation that was passed at the state level, which more or less, even though we have many problems with it, should be a loud and clear message to us that we are not creating enough affordable housing, that this is, you know, talking to communities like us, that we're not sol helping to solve the problem. So when it, we have this prime site and we have the opportunity to create, you know, some number of affordable housing units, and it's a great opportunity and we only come back with three net new units and just the conversion of the existing building, to me, it's not enough. And while, again, I applaud the efforts, the fundraising efforts, uh, the open space uh, provision, we're great at raising money for open space. We need more money and more will for affordable housing. And this is a lost opportunity if we forestall the chance to get, and again, I just proposed a modest number, seven units as opposed to five. It's, it's a tiny number, but as you know, every single unit is a fight. And this is our chance. So, you know, how, how about traffic? Well, you know, I don't have the ITE uh, trip generation model in front of me, but we're talking about like a car per half hour, okay? And, you know, it's, it, and I'm talking about, you know, one that goes, towards Upland and maybe another that goes towards Alt Marlboro Road. Is this a problem? How about neighbors impacts? We've got the Bruce Freeman Trail on one side, woods on the other where Upland is, woods on the back where the, where the river is. There are very few developments that could impact the neighborhood less than this parcel. And then uh, thirdly, um, you know, the kinds of units, right? So if we put literally just one duplex and one triplex on the site in addition to the existing duplex, they look very similar to the units that are just across the street up the hill, okay? And it's, it's not out of character. So I guess, you know, I just can't, with the way that it's currently supported, in spite of everyone's efforts, and I do appreciate so much everything that people have done, we just have to not take the, and again, I don't want to say it's an easy way out. It's certainly not easy, but we have to work even harder. And I guess that's why I, I would just ask for everyone that they think of the generosity of their spirit. It doesn't cost a dollar more. It's really providing the opportunity. And if we can all just rally and allow that to happen rather than falling back to, into our habits, um, we may make some progress here. So that's my view. Okay, thank you, Matt. Well, and Henry. I'm not sure that 
I mean, I, 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 I agree with you on the basic point, but I don't think that we need to decide that in order to uh, approve this appropriation. Well, if the MOU the, would be modified, well, certainly can, nothing it, would have to change in what we have in the warrant. But it could be modified in the, it, between now and the time that anything but is But I built. don't see any motive or, or you know, pressure to make a change in it unless we will, say something. And again, even if we say something, it may not matter. You know, They will need funding, and we will have some voice over the funding. Well, and in fact, that's the other thing as far as the cost. I mean, in the absence of a model, you know, we can just go that the going rate right now is four hundred dollars a square foot. If you imagine that we're going to build a total of five thousand built square feet, even if we do three incremental units, yeah. um, you know, it's two million dollars of additional construction cost plus the renovation costs for the duplex. So, you know, the town is putting forward one point six five million plus probably two million in the future. But what makes or more. what makes affordable housing difficult to build? has always been the cost of land or the value and, of yeah land. and that's where i say let's secure land wanna, but let's secure an adequate number of units for that land the yield of the land yes and <clears throat> um, i think we can we can work i mean i don't think we need to solve that problem now but it's good to bring it up and i think there's another thing this town ought to think about doing with sites like this is doing its own 40b projects the way we used a, to a friendly 40b right. well if it comes to that but i sure hope it doesn't right well i don't think I, think, all, I, not, think, I don't think that's all that bad. I mean, the state would like us to put 30, 40 units on this well, property. 40B doesn't mean 30 units. Okay. No, I mean, if you <laughs> look at the MBTA Communities Act, and this is within a half mile of an MBTA station, 16 units an acre, right? Isn't that what they said? Yeah. So you've got, what, four buildable acres here? So we're talking 40 plus units. So seven is not a unreasonable number yes but we're never going to see that mbta zoning okay here. but i, I mean, think i think have what teeth Matt, like 40b does now but i bet you if we don't get progress on this we will see teeth we can talk about this out in the street yeah right? yeah but <laughs> but i think um henry what matt is saying is that this is the leverage time um the select board has to take a position on this article and um, I think what Matt is saying is that this is our time to speak up, that we support the concept in general, but we'd like to get a few more units out of it if we can, or no, we support it as is. Because yes, it, if, if it changes, it'll change later, but this is the time when we have to speak up. How would you change it? How would you change what's in front of us now? Well, unfortunately, yeah. what's in front of us does not reveal the circumstances, right? Because there's no reference to a number of units in Article 25 but or, it, or of a division of Does land. it reference the MOU? I think it might reference the MOU, right? Or doesn't it? So, but changes could happen in the MOU without... Well, that's what you're proposing, right? That's no, right. But it doesn't reference the MOU. It doesn't. Okay, well then, yeah, there's nothing here... So, in other words, we, you don't have to change a word of Article 25 to do what I'm suggesting, nor do you necessarily, I mean, maybe it would be nice to change the allocations. It sounds like we don't want to have a, less than a $500,000 allocation for open space. We don't necessarily have to change the numbers in Article 26. You just decide in the MOU that that 300000 plus this 500000 gets you the yeah. land you need and to develop seven units. Well, I, I thought we were told when we were talking about the financing of the middle school that an MOU between town entities was unenforceable anyway. Well, and actually, Terry pointed out, I believe, that the MOU, as it's, as it's written, says five units are currently envisaged or something like this. It, right. it, doesn't it says no more have, than five units. Huh? It says no more than five units, and all of our fundraising is based on that number. If if this project changes, we SVT and CLCT have zero integrity in this town because we. Well, it's not you that's suggesting this change. It's us. Well, you then, know, you're not the ones changing the deal. What and happens we're to not the donations? changing the deal either. We're making a request, but you know, right. or at least I'm making. I don't. I don't know if right. my board members agree with me, but. Actually, yes, the MOU says it is presently contemplated 
Yeah. That um, there would be five affordable housing units. Right. So that could mean maybe we'll have more, maybe we'll have less. I well, know, I know you words. are really thinking you know, I don't five. I think but... that we should negotiate in bad faith, of course. Right. I, I would like to see that change, that be oh. amended. It does have a clause at the end that it may be amended by mutual agreement. I'm, I'm looking at page two where it says parcel A, the first sentence. It is presently contemplated. And that's what gave me pause. Because as Lee said, we don't know yet. There's a lot that could happen in the next two years. We don't know who's going to bid on it. Um, Matt said, you know, maybe we could have a duplex and a triplex. We don't know what's going to end up there. Maybe nobody will bid. Maybe we can't afford it at all. I really have no idea. Um, that's what makes this so difficult, all these unknowns. Um, but when you have it, it is presently contemplated, it gives you the flexibility, I think, that you haven't um, told anything to the um, doni donations in bad faith. You're just presently contemplating. That, I'm, 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 I apologize. It, that, that is not what we've told the donors. Okay. The donors understand that there will be five, no more than five units on this, and, because that's what everybody involved with this project agreed upon. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't see how we can, we can backtrack on that. OK. And the Affordable yeah. Housing Trust also said that their money, um, there needed to be five units in order for that money to be available. Meaning there needed to be at least five units. That's what five, needed to be five, made. Five yeah. units. Five, yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, Polly. I just would love to add one thing, if I might. Um, we spent many months. Uh, my name is Polly Reef, and I'm at 429 Williams Road, and I'm um, speaking on behalf of the Land Trust, the Concord Land Conservation Trust. I just want to point out that this group of, of many partners I mean, truly, you know, every housing group in town and land trusts um, spent months looking at this land and trying to figure out how, what, how can we optimize its benefit to the town in multiple ways. And um, working with the town planner, we looked at different scenarios that involved different numbers of houses, market rate, mixed use, all, all different kinds of things. And when we got to this one acre for affordable housing and six acres preserved as open space, um, something clicked. And it the on the acre, I mean, what I understood was that five units was kind of the right amount if you looked at the kind of housing people want to live in, if you look at the septic system needs, um, that that's what that acre could accommodate. Um, and it was it was a magic moment because we were not sure we were going to get to that point. It really was feeling kind of impossible to find that balance. We also then looked at the land value. If you assign value to buildable lots and um, and understand that a certain amount of land was already protected by the riverfront and so on, it's it started to feel like a number that might be attainable. That this was a feasible path that we were pursuing on both sides, on the land, the open space side and on the housing side. And I just don't want to, uh, un, I, I want you to understand how much work went into getting to that point and getting to that acre and six acre. We need to go into the closing with an understanding of what land is going to be preserved and what land is going to be set aside for development. Those lines needed to be drawn on a map. They're not mushy, you know, and, and in order to go out and raise money, we need to tell people what is envision, envisioned there. So that's what I needed to. So if, to all of you. if the open space component was reduced to 500,000 total between the existing reserve fund in this in the CPC article and the community housing was raised to 500,000 and then we allocated an initial quarter acre, wouldn't the open space per acre provision still work? Because now we have, you know, that the open space is paying less for all but a quarter acre of what they had before and the community housing is paying more i mean it's really just putting numbers in two different rows on the, the spreadsheet but it it as far as if you're trying to say dollars per acre for open space i think we can make that work 
even I, going to, to an see, acre and a quarter for, on, for community yeah. housing. You'd have to draw a new plan and see what can actually fit well, in there, I think. And yeah, I, it's just, <laughs> you know, slice the slice a little <laughs> further out. But, you know, that would give you more septic capacity. Would it support potentially seven and, units? And we've, I, we've secured wonderful commitments from people based on one plan with lines drawn on a map in a certain place. And it would be really difficult, I think, to go back and redraw those lines. But you at didn't this tell point. them you'd have to deal with us. <laughs> well, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, do you, so, you don't could, necessarily. I'm sorry, could I just well, also have... um, add that the the warrant does specify the, the, the breakout of the one acre and the six acres as shown on parcels A and B. So that was defined for the warrant. It was defined for the community in terms of the fundraising. It has also been presented to the Land and Water Conservation Fund. That is the proposal. We have had appraisals done on the property that are based on that division of land. And so to go and undo all of these things is supremely challenging at this stage in the game. I mean, we had to have these plans in order to get to where we are now, um, to have an article on the warrant, to have grant applications that were in front of the entities and agencies that need to be reviewing them. And, and I don't think it's realistic. I mean, from the fundraising level, I think Krista and Polly have made it very clear these commitments have been made on, on what has been presented to the community, but I don't think you can I, I, either go and change it from the granting um, standpoint. Everything changes, and it's it's. I think it will be very difficult to change that. Okay, thank you, um, Henry. Do you want to add anything? I, I think I think we beat this one to death. All right. Um, All right, and, um, um, Linda. Do you have anything else? To um, I, I, as I said before, um, a great deal has gone into this. Mm -hmm. There have been public hearings. Um, the project has evolved from um, the original um, proposal that um, Marsha, when she met with us in November, um, and entities have weighed in and to the select board along the way as well. When um, Keith Bergman came in talking about this as well, I, I think in one of his presentations. So well, I, you, you know how we stand, started out when this project is we were asked, what, about six months ago to approve, I think it was $140,000 140, as, as the down payment against right. a... Right, for 11 acres, for 11 units. A total, That's but a, a totally, totally refundable amount, uh, but to uh, tie up the property without, uh, and then since that point, um, uh, it's evolved without um, much involvement on our part. And um, um, maybe what they've come up with is, 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 a, is a good plan and a good compromise, but I think we've expressed the fact that um, um, there are other considerations that may not have been taken into account in their negotiations for the different, uh, what do you call them, stakeholders? Um, and so I think, it, um, and certainly nobody negotiated in bad faith. It's just, you know, it's kind of, uh, when you all get through, there's somebody else who has a voice in the decision as well. So um, I think we should probably stay on top of this and see whether we can negotiate with the parties to get a result that might work better for the town. Mm -hmm. after we get through this phase of it. I don't think we need to change a word of any of these warrant articles or the amounts that are set out in the CPA um, schedule. And But okay. put everybody I notice that uh, we're concerned. All right, so are people prepared to vote now or um, <clears throat> does anyone want to make a motion now or do we want to? wait until we have a full board to take our vote. What's your pleasure? Nice. It's a silence deafening. It is. Yeah, I wish Susan was here to 
also weigh in on this? Yeah. She started to at the last meeting. And I agree. Um, but maybe that gives us an excuse to have a pause and everybody reflect and we can, you know, report a town meeting and we can keep discussing it. Um, I know that's not, um, there are many people who will not like that decision, but does anybody want to make a motion right now or? Okay, I, I think seeing none, we will report at town meeting then. Oh, yes. Um, uh, Nancy, 25 Road. Oh, um, I guess you have to come up to the microphone. Sorry about that. No, sorry. Well, I just feel like if we expect to have anything move, change between now and town meeting, we would need to make a statement now. Okay. You know what I mean? Um, so, but I, I wouldn't make a motion in the affirmative. Okay. But okay. Yes. Um, please uh, Nancy, state your name. Nancy Kerr, 25 Upland Road. I um, I'm really disturbed that this at this late date is now being questioned. I think that's really um, unfortunate. And I just, um, it seems to me that there's land for sale, or not land, but houses for sale all the time in Concord. I mean, buy another piece of land and make affordable housing there. I mean, why all of a sudden, like, oh, we need to do it on this exact property? Their housing, you know, their their mansionizations all over town. One of those houses, instead of being a mansion, could turn into affordable housing. You can jump on those properties. I just don't see why this has to be the one. Okay. And um, I, I don't think that the present duplex is considered affordable housing. So we are getting five. I mean, that's a lot. It's five more than we have. Okay. Thank you for your comment. Thank you. I mean, I would say that this is not like a sudden change of heart on my part. Um, we have had numerous occasions in our board meetings um, to uh, you know, go over this, and I've expressed very consistent views on my part, and I know that others have expressed doubts as well. So it's not like we're suddenly foisting this on people. On the other hand, I realize that we also haven't had a direct seat at the table. So well, exactly. now it does so, seem sudden. Right. I mean, if you had but, these feelings, you know, there have been countless meetings and public meetings that could have been expressed and could have gone into the mix in the past six well, or eight months. We've been, I mean, <laughs> our select board meetings are all public. Well, so are ours. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Madam Chair, we, 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 Mike, are you? Okay, and then after Mike, we have Frank Feely on Zoom, and then another Frank Feely oh, in the audience. Can't see behind Lee Smith there. Okay, all right, Mike Lawson, go ahead. Mike Lawson, 1695 Lowell Road. I'm a member of the Concord Municipal Affordable Housing Trust, but I'm speaking for myself. I hope you will give us the opportunity to try to put this together and actually create some affordable housing. I don't think the choice is between seven units and five units. I think the choice is between five units and no units. The select board has appointed the Affordable Housing Trust. We have the Concord Housing Development Corporation, a number of groups in affordable housing and a number of open space groups. They've all worked very hard to try to create something that we could all agree to. I wish there was more. That's what five. I hear over and over again. I just can't understand Lee why we wishes can't do it. There more too, because it's a very delicate compromise. And we've negotiated this as carefully and as aggressively as we could. And this is a solution that we are all comfortable with. Often in town, you might recall that there's often conflict between open space and affordable housing, and sometimes conflict between affordable housing and neighbors. And all of those things came together here in a very special way where the open space groups, the affordable housing groups, and the neighbors are all supportive of this. We get five affordable units. We get a beautiful piece of open space. I hope you'll give us the opportunity to bring this to fruition for the town. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, okay. I, I do want to note we don't get the, I mean, we get two units today right we get the opportunity to build three okay we or have a few more public said comments the, the alternative ahead. is for there to be zero affordable housing and lack of control over what's actually built there when it's sold on the private market to developers 
Okay, Frank? Um, yes, I, uh, Frank Feely, President of uh, Concord Housing Foundation, 347 Lexington Road. Um, needless to say, the foundation would have liked more affordable units too. Uh, but when we looked at the whole package, uh, we realized that this was a, the best deal that we could see and that we do get five units. Uh, they don't necessarily have to be built at 400,000 a unit. There are other ways to get those units reasonably affordable. Uh, but what I worry about is this falling apart because frankly, the open space folks can raise money more than we can. And we needed the open space folks to fill the gap. And without that, we'd have, pardon the expression, McMansions on this site if we don't buy it as a town. So for that reason, uh, we went along with the five, even though we would have preferred more. Okay, that's helpful, thank you. Are there other public comments? Um, oh, let Madam me Chair, um, see if there's someone on Zoom first um, before, because you've already- I think uh, Keith on. Bergman has, has had his hand up for a Keith. while. Okay, Keith Bergman. Hi, hi Keith Bergman, uh, 56 White Avenue, Chair of the uh, Concord Municipal Affordable Housing Trust and the only one attending virtually tonight. Everyone else is in the room, so hello, fellow members. Uh, I, I'd certainly echo the comments uh, that have been made that the trust would have preferred more affordable housing, but ultimately uh, having uh, been given the opportunity to see a couple of iterations, went with the one that produced uh, five affordable units rather than two, uh, which was what was shown to us initially. And that uh, sold the deal for us. We took a vote uh, uh, that said we would support uh, at least uh, five affordable units on this property, uh, but ultimately uh, agreed to signing a uh, memorandum of understanding, which uh, sets the number of affordable units at five. So uh, hope that uh, so that's the position of the of the trust. We're we're at five and are supportive of this uh, of this uh, acquisition uh, going through. So, uh, and thanks everyone for the, the great effort that has uh, brought, us, uh, brought us this far and hope we get all the way. Okay, thank you, Keith. Is there anyone else online that wants to make a brief comment? All right, seeing none, um, Nancy, you can have one last comment. Uh, Nancy Kerr, 25 Upland Road. I know it seems like because of my address that, it's, that I don't want it in my backyard and uh, I, I'm not going to talk about the affordable housing, but housing in general, this is a really fragile piece of land. It is a riverfront. It's a hill. It's just not a good place to put put housing. I mean, five units, yes, that's fine, but I just don't think it's a place you want to th throw a bunch of houses and have the sewage going into the river. I mean, okay. I think we're trying to protect that land. It's not just a regular six-acre piece of land. Okay, thank you for your comment. Um, all right, this will be the last comment on this. Please state your name and address. Uh, Glenn Marmon, uh, 416 Old Marlboro Road. Uh, we live next to the duplex. If you look at the map in the southern corner, we're the rectangle that's missing out of the out of the map. Uh, and so obviously this has been a, a very uh, interesting uh, project for us uh, to be involved with and to know about. Um, and uh, I have been incredibly impressed from what I've seen of the different stakeholders coming to something that it seems like everyone uh, can support um, because there were lots of, I was in many of those CPC meetings and there were many times where I didn't think we'd get to anything that anybody supported in any um, uh, large function. So I'm, I'm really impressed uh, by the uh, work done by, by various groups to get to the point that we are at today. Um, and, uh, you know, from what we've heard here, what, I, what I've heard in previous conversations, um, I think earlier the, the, the select board was expressing that, you know, this was feedback they wanted to give, make sure that this was a perspective that was heard. But it, it seems to me like from what I'm hearing of the housing stakeholders that this this has been a perspective that they've had. They want they wanted as many affordable housing units as as they could get. And this is 
where it got to. And as someone for whom this is literally their backyard, um, I welcome the affordable housing. I recognize that it will result in a bunch of uh, construction that will be obnoxious to listen to, um, but it is a noble goal and it is a thing that the, um, that the town needs. And so I am proud to support this plan, um, both emotionally and financially through the uh, open space fundraising. Um, and I do really uh, fear what happens if we try to change things at this point. They've so much work has gone in to get things where they are right now. Um, I do share the belief that it's not a choice between five or seven or more than that. It's a choice between five or this falling apart and all of that just getting turned into not affordable housing and that it's a choice between five and zero. So thank you very much. Okay. Does the select board wish to, um, anybody want to make a motion now, or are we going to report at town meeting? Okay, I think we're going to wait for Susan and um, report at town meeting. Uh, Carrie? No, I thought Linda looked like oh, she was Linda. going to say something. Um, yeah, I'm prepared to make a motion. Oh, go ahead. Okay, I move affirmative action on Article 25. Is there a second? Okay, seeing none, we will continue until um, we have Susan here um, and we will have to make a decision by town meeting. Thank you everybody. Very a huge amount of work, beautiful site, and we will figure something out somehow. Thank you. Okay, back to Article 26. Is there any more discussion from the board on any of Article 26? Do we want to vote on Article 26 tonight? Well, I, I don't know if we got clarity about whether it mattered about the allocation of funds on uh, item F. Uh, right, I don't think we got clarity. So what I'm going to suggest is that since we don't seem to have any of the rest of it um controversial or questions that we take a vote on 26 and then if something develops on 25 and we have to reconsider we could always do that so so i i'm going to suggest that we go ahead with 26 tonight if we can um just so we can print in the warrant i just wonder if it would create any confusion that's, that's it all. might <laughs> um what do you think? Anybody? Does anybody want to make a motion on 26? I'll, I'll move you that to... we um, recommend a affirmative action on Article 26 as it appears in the, in the warrant. All right. Is there a second? I'll, I'll second it then if I can for discussion. Do you? Well, I'm just concerned about, again, this allocation of funds relative to Article 25 and whether that will lead to confusion about kind of where the board is on this article so well i think that um one of the th other things we're going to do tonight is is on some of these articles we have to write a little explanation yes so we could say that you want to assign somebody which i think yeah. makes sense by the way yeah if you're volunteering but i was going to say if you don't want to if um yeah. if um i think that whoever writes it up and if no one wants to write it up I will but we could say if something else develops in 25 there might be a different allocation but that we support the one million dollars total I think there's a way to write this up okay I just but you don't have to agree okay <laughs> um what do you think Linda so I'm trying to recall at this point um I think just our I thought just our recommendation went in the FinCom book, not for right. most uh, of them. That's right. But for a few, we might end up writing a couple of sentences if there's some confusion. Okay. If, if... Are you in favor of uh, moving this article tonight or, or waiting until we resolve? I thought we already had a motion on the table. Right. Okay. Second. We have a motion on the table. So is everybody ready to vote? Um, okay. All in favor of affirmative action on Article 26. Aye. Aye. 
All opposed? No. Okay, the article Thank you very passes much. three to one. And we are now on Article 29, parking. This is 29. Can I just, before we move on, can I just talk about what the process will be for adding a few sentences and whether the board would see that? To the oh, whether the to, board to, would to the see fin that. So, oh. There won't be anything in the FinCom right. report. The no, FinCom I, report will just say select board vote. Okay, I thought that there were a few. That's, that's, that's what I, was I thought there might be a few where we had to. We're going to be discussing um, this whole thing at 845 yeah, anyway. I, my, my, yeah, but my concern was what comment I made okay. earlier about the FinCom vote. Well, that would even be easier if we don't have to write anything. Okay. Okay, we are going to continue now with Article 29. Uh, Carrie, do you want to give a very brief synopsis of this article? It's the uh, parking meter receipts. Right, so Article 29 is essentially the appropriation of the parking meter budget, and the amount requested is 300000 I think, in the warrant. It, it originally started at 400,000, uh, which is more closely resembled our pre-COVID expenditure from that particular fund. But we've revised it down to 300,000. It is funded through parking meter receipts. And the main components of, of the budgeted funding are uh, the meter maintenance. And uh, we have police personnel that are assigned to monitoring the meters, and then there's there's some addition, some incidental striping projects that go along with that as well. So that's we what that project is. We do own the meters, and we have a, an annual contract with a third party to maintain the meters. Okay. Is there any discussion on this article? Yeah, the question I have is, what is the effect if this does not pass? <laughs> So if this does not pass, then we do not have an appropriation to, um, to, to maintain the meters or we wouldn't be able to necessarily enforce um, that the recommendation from staff would then be to discontinue the program to shut the meters off because we wouldn't, we don't, we have a third party to, to maintain and we need the receipts from from the uh, the meters in order to fund that cost. Well, and then how, would how, there how, oh, go ahead? Would there be a breach of contract of any sort? Would we be in default? So we have a three year contract that actually ends this June thirty, and we have an opportunity to extend, and we also have an opportunity with a certain amount of notice to to get out of the contract. When is that? When does that notice period expire? I, I would have to look at, at the contract. Yes, I, I mean, it, it, this may be a referendum on the continuation of parking meters, in effect, whether what we decide to do on this. But if we have the opportunity also to non-renew the contract, that means that we can fund you know, the obligation, but still not make a commitment to the ongoing um, parking meter arrangement. Sure, and I think the only other thing that I would mention, if if town meeting were to to turn down, vote no action on this, we would have a slight budget issue because there there is the the striping would still need to be done, and we don't have that accounted for in the in the town's general fund budget. Striping meaning not the lines in the middle of the street, but the the marking the parking spaces. I, I think we've, in some years, it's been limited to just the parking spaces. In some years, it's been a little more liberal than that. But there, there is some amount of work that would be required to be done on an annual basis that would not be uh, planned for in the town's general fund budget. But if we don't have parking meters, we don't need parking spaces. Still well, I think where people are going to pull in, however. Right. I. I I would assume that we would do that. Well, okay. I, 
just thought I'd ask. Yeah, I think that's a good question. Um, and I'd like to know um, how much we're talking about and how much notice we would need, um, whether, you know, we have to give more than 60 days notice or something like that. But generally... Um, so the contract expires on June 30, 2020. There's not... It, 2022, you mean? 2022, excuse me. Mm. Uh, so there's there's not an automatic renewal of that contract so it's either going right. to expire right. or we are going to issue a request for proposals for a new contract okay okay so it will automatically lapse at the end <clears throat> and then we would have the opportunity presumably to enter into a new contract or to extend the existing yes. contract yes after how, what what is the cost of that contract approximately? Um, it is it's about one hundred and twenty thousand dollars per year. Mm -hmm. So the remainder of the budget is for um, enforcement with the police department and and striping enforcement replacement of um, of parts. The the meters themselves, the replace the um, the maintenance is very significant. As we've talked about before, we have issues with cell coverage and so um, there's a lot of replacement that that happens more frequently than would if um, if the meters weren't continually searching for a signal and is there any progress on Verizon getting a, a new site for why wireless in the center so I do believe that there is a proposal to add some additional um, on an existing site, and I believe that Verizon is the carrier. And then we have the potential proposal to, to have a tower at Kai's Road that we have not advanced significantly. Well, because we, they were going to do a private, they said, installation. That's what Kate reported. So, so I'm just curious if that's moved forward, because I think that's material to the effectiveness of these meters, right? It's it is that that issue needs to be resolved for the meters for public safety for um, the, yeah. the convenience of, of people visiting the town, um, the center, I guess the the issue is it wasn't that long ago that the town invested a significant amount to replace those meters so that was maybe 2016. And I, I think any day of the week, if you ask if people are in favor of the meters, I think 50% of the people are and 50% <laughs> of the people aren't. And, and I think that can change day to day. So I, I just would be concerned about making a decision without really having much of a public process. And I understand over the years, the town has had public processes, but uh, I, th this is kind of a big decision to make in a very short period of time with very limited public input. Well, I agree with that. Um, and we do have coming up um, in the next few months a long term uh, parking discussion that we need to have. Um, I think the, the benefits of this program are mostly for the contractor and possibly for the police who are earning overtime, but not for really for the citizens or the businesses, because if you think about Sundays, we don't really have a parking problem. We don't have a problem on Saturdays when it's Christmas time and it's the busiest time of year and we don't enforce the meters. And most of the budget does not go to the striping. So altogether, I have not been in favor of parking, and I've heard recently that the business community is 50-50, or even more businesses do not want to have the parking. So at this time, I would have to vote no action on this article, or we could take some time and report at town meeting. But that, that's just my position. What do others think? Would it be possible to, to extend the, the 
contract for for a limited period of time, like on a month to month basis while we were making our decision. Rather than say we have to we have to make a decision between now and June 30th, otherwise we have us we have a town full of dead parking meters. So we have a contract through June 30. I, I was going to suggest that perhaps we could look at doing a one year extension of the contract so that there could be an analysis and an opportunity for the public to weigh in. I don't know that we would need to do a month to month extension because we'll have town meeting before the contract expires. So, okay. Linda? So the one year extension makes more sense to me given uh, time to go out to the public and also to have a better sense of whether or not the private entity is going to hmm extend their contract with or allow extra uh, if it's Verizon mm -hmm. that's working with a private party. Um, the other concern about the contract is, you know, usually you can't let them run out uh, and still get the extension. You know, usually there's a 30 day clause or something yeah. in there. Yeah, yeah well, we, we certainly can take a look at that now that I have a better sense of, of where the board is relative to I'm sure they'd article. love to have the business. I mean, it's not like they have to make an investment in order to continue for a few months. It's just more revenue for them. But um, during that one year period, we're still probably not going to have any better cell service in, in the area, which is one of the big problems with these meters. I think it depends on what the solution is. Um, I, I don't want to speak out of turn. I don't know. I, I am aware of a potential um, a potential solution, but I, I don't know that it has been discussed publicly. And so I think if that solution were to come to fruition, that would be in a in a pretty short term. If we were to try to uh, come up with a plan to have a tower at the Kai's Road campus, that that would be more than a year likely because we still have to work with the national park service i don't think that the real issue is cell service i think the real issue is what is the benefit of this program and what is the cost and i but i would support a one-year um continuation to study it um but if we come back here next year and we're still studying it i mean we really have to actually do some research and have a board discussion and and have some public input during the year and, and if we can do that i would support the article so how far down the road does the 300 and some odd thousand dollars take us well that would be until june 30 2023 yeah okay so all right let me make like all the best com uh, compromises it requires us to do nothing well, no, we have to have a motion. We have to have a motion. So move to recommend affirmative action on Article 29 as written in the warrant. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. Thank you for that suggestion, Carrie. We'll study it this year. Great. Okay. We are on to Article 32 and 33. I see Burton Flint is here. Thank you for your patience. Burton, take a quick sip of water. All right. Matt is leaving for one minute. Burton, do you want to come up? Yeah, I wasn't planning on making any presentation, but I'm not No, that's okay. We, I think we have some questions for you. All right. uh, this is what are you talking about now? 32? 32 and 33. Okay, formula business and the Thoreau business district. Correct. Okay. Henry, do you have some questions? Do you want to start? Well, I here? wouldn't say I have a question. I have a statement. I will always... In unalterably be uh, opposed to the formula business bylaw, which I think is, and any of its extensions for two reasons. One is I think it's bad policy. And number two, I am convinced that if anybody ever litigates it, the town will lose. So those two reasons I think definitely should not be extended. And if we wanted to be serious about it and about our litigation budget for the future we would uh, consider repealing it okay so that means i'm not in favor of right. extending it okay 
in case I haven't made, made myself clear. Linda? So maybe uh, you're going to speak about this. That there was some tweaking of the language <coughs> regarding. Oh, with, in accordance with the suggestions, Terry, you had made about either versus they. and It's just some uh, like, minor wordsmithing. Yeah, I think we've got to consider those at our meeting tomorrow night. We, I mean, you, you sent those wordsmithing changes in, but I don't know that there's been any process to make those changes as of yet. Yeah. Right. Our first I'm meeting the, since you sent those I'm in. I'm the tomorrow. one who sent those in. It's just, it's not a substantive thing. It's a wordsmithing type thing. Yeah. Okay. Um, Matt? So um, I know this may be kind of shocking, but um, as someone who uh, brought forward the original formula business um, bylaw uh, back in 2010, there's a petition article that didn't pass, but then subsequently one for West Concord passed in 2011. And then later when I was on the planning board, we passed one for uh, Concord Center um, that actually, um, there's a concern that I have about extending to Thorough Depot. And that is that um, there's a, a very extensive article that was written uh, by Mark Bobrowski, who um, is uh, you know, formerly of the planning board and also just an authority on Massachusetts uh, land law, but also um, you know, has thought hard about uh, the constitutional issues involved here. And his view um, at the end of this article that was written uh, specifically on the formula business question um, had a concluding, near concluding paragraph that said this, uh, finally, district caps or bans like that imposed as a townwide cap or ban will be closer call on judicial review. However, where a municipality has good reason to install the district cap or ban, such as the historic or cultural value of the district, the burden may be tolerated, particularly when the municipality offers valid opportunities to locate formula businesses in other districts. So my concern is that if we continue the march of um, you know, controlling uh, each of our business districts with a formula of business restriction that we are in fact uh, potentially increasing the exposure, not just because there's more opportunity for a business owner to, to um, you know, object, but really because we are not um, continuing to offer a, a real opportunity there. And I should also mention the second thing is that if I think of Thorough, Thorough Depot District, the businesses <clears throat> that are most prominent there are actually uh, formula businesses. So those like Starbucks, uh, CVS, um, Dunkin' Donuts, um, Ace Hardware, um, Crosby's, uh, and I, I don't want to leave anybody out, but the idea is that as opposed to our other business districts where we have you know, many uniquely defined um, you know, uh, establishments. Uh, there in a Thorough Depot, we have more of a, a convention of, of having um, these branded businesses. The third thing is that as opposed to the other districts where we really are uh, trying to preserve the look and feel of those sites, we in the same town meeting have a proposal to upzone the Thorough Depot district. In other words, we are hoping, I think, uh, through zoning to encourage, uh, you know, development in in a in probably a, a different scale than in the past. So I think that those three things conspire to, is in my mind, against extending the formula business legislation to or bylaw to uh, include Thorough Depot. All right, um, Burton, do you want to respond to that? Yeah, sure. And thanks, Matt, for sending me that article. I think the overriding point of that article was it was he was doing an analysis based upon the dormant commerce clause, That's right. which is about as, um, you know, it's a facts and circumstances test, a little like nailing jello to a tree in terms of um, it's oftentimes the outcome of a dormant commerce clause case will be dependent upon the right that's being protected. And, and so 
I, I, I don't think that there can be a litmus test or bright line test, especially in something like this, which there hasn't been much litigation on. I would point out that the Wellfleet case that has been decided by the land court on this didn't really look to the dormant commerce clause. No. It just looked to use versus ownership, right? And we have tried to tailor our language as you were part of to be focused entirely on use rather than, than ownership. Now, um, the as the question as to to you know whether it's good policy in the first case you know, um that, that you know of course there will be people that have different opinions either way the one in west concord has been popular it hasn't been tested the one in in in, in concord center has been popular it was popular and, and when we were talking about as you talked about the upzoning of um the thorough depot business district um, that was something that people were also looking to for there. They were saying, well, if there is going to be change, we want that change to reflect the character of what's here. That doesn't mean keeping all the buildings the same size or keeping the same density of development necessarily, though for some that would be the case. But when it comes to speaking about, about the formula business bylaw, I think it means that the types of uses which we like in, in the Thoreau Depot as it exists today. So, um, I think they're all good points. I think they're they are all rebuttable, and I think that we have tried to focus on, 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 on use rather than than what the land the land courts test for ownership. I think uh, the problem. I, I would love it if the formula business bylaw created more of the types of business we wanted, but I don't. Th I don't think you can you can do that through zoning. It's largely a matter of economics and um, patterns of occupation. Sure. Is, very few of the businesses in Concord are owned by residents of the town, and few of their employees can afford to be residents of the town. And <clears throat> the value of real estate is such that um, the mom and pop business is not going to be uh, seriously promoted by a restrictive zoning bylaw and um the um um the uh so um the and so i don't think it accomplishes oh and I, what, what what's what's slipping my mind is that we really haven't hit the hard limit in any of these districts mm -hmm. which is when we are going to see some we're going to see some real legal problems arise when it's no longer possible to get a special permit but there are no special permits available regardless sure um and um, um so um if you have a limit that's always higher than what you've got the question is does a limit accomplish anything um everybody who's applied for a special permit and I'm aware, I think of only two or three cases, they've been granted routinely to businesses that are, you know, like one of them has like, you know, over a hundred branches worldwide and things like that, which um, it kind of seems that they're being issued on a pro forma basis until we hit the ceiling. And then we're gonna have a, we're gonna, we're gonna have a, a, a real difficulty and you're gonna have to say to somebody who has owned, some commercial real estate and they have a tenant and we have to say to them you just can't rent to that tenant and okay okay good perhaps, oh, thank you it. henry I, that's that's it's, the problem that i have with it and i it, i do want to just say that you know the reason why i might be opposed to this and and again this is just i i'm putting this out there i really you know am not a attorney um but I do, I am concerned just based upon this information. And I was able to check in with Mr. Bobrowski uh, when he was representing a client in front of the uh, planning board a few years later, because this article is now 10 years old. Um, you know, and he still felt that there was the same, you know, I said, hey, what do you think was we were gonna be extending this to Concord Center? And he said, well, as long as there's another place, you know, and that was his view. And I, I really respect that. Um, and uh, I just, uh, I'm, concerned that if we do if we overextend we might jeopardize what we have today in West Concord and in Concord Center and I consider it a great success that I mean we haven't ever hit the limit it shows that we do have this distinctive business district so they have continued to endure as distinctive 
unique sets of businesses in those districts. Okay. Linda, do you have anything to add? No. All right. Um, does anyone want to make a motion? Yes. Yeah, okay, very quick comment. Yeah, quick. Sure, sure. I just, I just want to... uh, we are running almost one hour late now. I know. <laughs> I'm sure you do. Yeah, thank you. Tanya Gale, 62 Prescott Road. I didn't I wasn't really planning to comment on either of these articles, but as as you were discussing, um I know that one um, one um, uh, controversy with the authority for rezoning is uh, is that some people think it will create affordable housing and others think there is no guarantee. Um, and um, I was wondering if the uh, if there could be some kind of uh, program where if, if a developer creates affordable housing, then they can also rent it to a formula business or some, some kind of like, uh, you know, using the two things against each other to create more affordable housing. Thank okay. You. Good idea. We might think about it in the future. Okay. Um, are we ready for a motion on this? I guess I, I mean, again, I'm I'm willing to wait, and if we get more evidence, uh, you know, then we could rule later. I just I have these concerns, and at this point, I would be, you know, ruling no action. I would suggest recommending no action. If I could make a couple just final points, I mean, Terry. Oh, okay. Yeah, now the planning board has not weighed in on this, right? Well, it's what do you mean planning, planning board, board article? Oh, it's the planning board article. Duh. Never yeah. mind. So I would point out that that. There has been a case in Massachusetts I alluded to in Wellfleet on formula business restrictions on formula businesses, and all the all towns have come up with sort of similar but slightly varying versions. In the town of Wellfleet's uh, that the land court struck down, and, bec and because it essentially restricted formula businesses entirely from Wellfleet, we've we, it, Matt's point about we're extending it district by district. We're effectively also extending the the pool the the cap of formula businesses. So all taken together, I think if you added up the numbers across these three districts, it's in the mid thirties. In particular, if, if you, the point that there's existing formula businesses that are predominant in the district today, we're essentially preserving a model that allows for a lot of formula businesses and the Thoreau Depot. Um, since that Wellfleet case, we have passed additional formula business uh, district bylaws, and 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 the, in the article uh, that that Matt alluded to, it was that our original article was discussed and so, somewhat favorably as one that um, yeah. seemed to pass muster. We've passed another one, which of course has had to be approved by the AG. So we, it, you know, it might be a bridge too far, but there's nothing to indicate that in in our discussions or in the review by town council. So well, and that's the other thing is that of course town council hasn't weighed in on, on this and the AG ultimately would weigh in from a constitutional yeah, perspective. So that's why I'm not like out there really ready to to say no action on this, but I've just wanted to share my misgivings. But the subsequent ones have been also only approved by the attorney general's office, which was the same office that for instance approved Wellfleet by law, by the way. And um, and the reason that the um, attorney general's office did did not um, uh, refuse to approve our second uh, attempt at it was because they said that it had not been specifically held to be contrary to statute, not that it was um, would be unenforceable if litigated, but um, Judge Long was very clear in the Wellesley case. That, it, that such a bylaw, the Wellfleet law, was not only facially invalid, but was invalid as applied. Mm -hmm. And the Wellfleet bylaw did not have an absolute ceiling, and ours was more, way more restrictive. So, but that's just as the, as our town moderator said to me on the front of the front of the steps of the town house about a year ago. She said, "Reasonable people can disagree." Fair. Okay, so what does the board want to do with this article? Do we want to make a motion tonight? I recommend affirmative action. Affirmative action. Okay. Okay. Is there a second? No second. All right. Is there any other motion? Okay, I guess we're going to report a town meeting again. 
We're going to have a few uh, late nights coming up here. All right, we're on to Article 33. Uh, what is the board discussion on Article 33, Thoreau Depot Business District? Any comments, questions on that? I think it's an excellent set of best practices for zoning for a district like this, and I hope that it leads to uh, development according to the, the kind of patterns that they, they have uh, developed. I agree. And my only question, though, is with this new MBTA wrinkle, um, does that change any of your thinking on this? Does it change? It's really unfortunate timing, the way that law came out, right, when you had just finished this work. But does anything change because of that? Uh, I don't think it changed the planning board's deliberations. It didn't change my view in moving the article forward. We were responding to the long range plan and the housing production plan. I think it was raised as something where um, people said, well, this is going to come along. Why don't you wait? As maybe a tactic to take our foot off the gas and moving forward with what we thought was the appropriate article at that time. Um, the I, I, I heard Mr. Dane say previously, that there's some doubt as to whether we would ever become subject to the MBTA Communities Act. And I think looking at the regulation, I mean, you saw the article I wrote on that. I think looking at the regulations now that our, uh, Concord would rather deal with the consequences than deal with the act uh, right. because um, it, it's just untenable in, in, mm -hmm. our, in, in the 50 acre parcels surrounding our MBTA stations. I'll take that one step further, I believe when you look at what they tried to do and what they what what having a half mile circle with uh, multifamily housing 15 15 units to, to the acre uh, I if if they had any real plan I think it must have been really to find a way to redistribute um, housing funds in other words to have a formula which by its consequences would in fact cut communities like Concord out of eligibility for the funds that they will withhold if you do not you do not adopt the zoning because it's inconceivable that a town like Concord would accept this type of zoning. It would mean completely rebuilding the town. Yeah. Okay. And, and I can say based upon the public discourse we had around this act, which I would think is a relatively modest proposal that I, I think that the uh, the MBTA Communities Act would go over like a lead balloon. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, are we ready for? So I move to recommend affirmative action on Article 33 as printed in the warrant. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? No. Okay. So that passes three to one. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Burton. All right, we're going on to Article 36, which I think we can do very quickly. I would just like to address um, a few questions from the public hearing. I worked with Kari Tari, and she also contacted the Secretary of State's office. The cost was one question. If we have a one question ballot, which is usually what we have, the total cost of printing and mailing would be about $2,400. How much? $2,400. There is a sample in the packet of what Burlington did. Um, looks like this. It's basically, um, this is my black and white printer, but um, it looks like the uh, referendum that you get on the statewide ballots. But as a practical matter, you know that to our town clerk sends out mailings reminding people of elections anyway. So there may not be any additional cost or any significant additional cost because we Possibly. are very proactive about uh, encouraging people to vote. And so this could easily fit within that kind of structure okay. without additional cost. All right, um, two more um, comments. Um, another question from the public hearing was, how does town council know who to contact to write the pro and con statements? 
So Kari and I studied this in section E of chapter 53, section 18B states that the principal proponents are sometimes the school committee or the finance committee or a ballot question committee, or it could be the first 10 signers of a petition article. And finally, um, Kari reminded me that there are some more benefits of this article that I had not even thought of. For example, the election workers right now are not allowed to explain anything about a ballot question or answer any questions. So if we pass this article, the election workers would be allowed to give out the handout, which is the same as what people got in the mail, or point to it hanging on the wall. Um, and the mailing, when it goes out, might also increase voter turnout and remind people, as Henry said, that an election is coming up. And one really good example is in this warrant, we have Article 22 for um, debt exemption for the CCHS access road, but that election will not take place until September. So it is entirely possible that a voter could come in in September and not remember what it is that they're voting for. So I think it would be helpful and I hope the board will support and the town meeting will support Article 36. Of course, this election coming up, it would not apply. It would, you know, it has to go through. I move affirmative action. Okay. <laughs> Second. Just wanted to answer the questions yeah. from the public hearing. So maybe I should formalize that. I move that we recommend affirmative, affirmative action, action yeah. on Article 36 as written in the warrant. Thank you. And Is that a second? I always stand corrected. And I'm rarely corrected, but I always stand there. Uh -huh. Are you seconding, well, are you seconding it, though? No? Yes, I accept that. All right. As a... Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, thank you. And now we are on Article 37. Uh, we do have a little update from the petitioner, Joe Stein. I'm not sure if he is with us. I am. Good morning. Good evening. Okay. There he is. Okay. Are there any more questions or comments from the board on Article 37, uh, given that Joe has provided some material in our packet? I just had a question about what I consider to be the human nature of the situation. The argument is that um, asking, asking people to pay for a bag is much more effective in discouraging bag use than by giving them a discount. But in the nature of things is not at least it's not at least in a supermarket when you go in and you buy are you not likely to just automatically see that charge on your receipt that will be automatically put on your bill unless you say whoa what about this i didn't take a bag okay um joe do you want to answer that question um sure i i'm not 100 uh, percent clear on it but um i mean as, as I understand it, um, you know, this this checkout bag charge is, is enacted in Boston and, and other cities. And and when you go purchase uh, an item at a retailer, they will ask you if you'd like a bag. And you would say yes or no. If you say yes, it would be printed on the receipt as a taxable item. I don't know if that answers your question, Dane. Does that answer your question? Well, I mean, it's an answer, but I might, I guess if, 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 if a store that I'm shopping in uh, is subject to this, I'm certainly going to look at my receipt to see if they charge me for a bag, whether I brought my own or not. Okay. Other questions, comments? So at the, at the meeting where we last discussed this, I, I think there was a request to see some additional copy in terms of what the motion would actually look like. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure that was in our packet, was it? Right. So um, there was something that came through today by email. There were quite a few emails that came through today. Um, I, I did see that. I'm and I think it is the entire motion. Yeah. Okay. And I don't have it in front right. of me There's right like now. Revised language to reflect the Sudbury law. Is that correct? Yeah. That's right. Yeah. 
I know it came through today, which is kind of last minute. Yeah, well, so I, I did see that then. So um, the the in the article itself, it talks about um, charge of such bag equal to or greater than ten cents per checkout bag. Mm -hmm. So there's not a definitive cost. That's one problem. Um, I I do think there's some problems with definitions. Some of the material I saw refers to bags with handles, but then when you re actually read the article, um, it, that's not clear in mm. terms of how it appears. And um, in, in some ways, you know, I, I certainly um, support <laughs> encouraging all of us for sustainability practices, um, but I just don't feel like this is ready for prime time. Mm. Okay. I mean, I I understand that not setting it to an exact 10 cents, but to a minimum of 10 cents, because as we saw in some of the material provided, the bags themselves can cost up to 60 cents. I mean, that's the cost of the of the bag. Right. So, you know, it, I think and then there will be inflation. So the thing is, if we're not going to have, you know, to amend this on, a, on an ongoing basis, I think that. And then we had mixed reactions, excuse me, Matt. We had mixed reactions from some of the shopkeepers in terms yeah. of being in favor or not in and favor. And this is not something that permits the shop. The, no, it the requires shop, at least requires a 10 cents it requires charge per bag. It yeah, I mean, it so that even if, presumably, even if they wanted to say, um, we're giving you the bag free because you're a good customer, or we're, they can't do that. Right. right. No, that's the the idea, and um, you know, I I did well, hear the the objections, public. you know, about uh, tourists, you know, don't tend to bring their own bags, which I I kind of understand, and at the same time, I also think it's um, useful to set that tone in, in that conquers the kind of place where you pay for your bag, um, and that tourists will see that. I mean, it's it, it says that we care about sustainability, um, and so I'm I'm okay. I've been to many municipalities uh, in different parts of the country that have this in place. Um, I've also lived in Europe, where it would be shocking that they wouldn't charge for the bag um, or even provide a bag in many cases um, if you didn't bring your own. Um, it's a it's a habit, and we we need to encourage that habit and this is the probably the most proactive way to do it without literally preventing people from having bags which would be <laughs> obnoxious so i mean you know it's an it's really an incidental charge it's really making a statement um but it i think it's a statement we need to make okay is there further discussion Okay. Oh, Somebody on Zoom has a comment, a brief comment. Pamela Dritt, 13 Concord Green. I'm strongly in favor of this. It's the right kind of behavioral economic nudge that doesn't cost the vendors any the, the businesses anything in terms of freedom and um, uh, money. Okay, thank you. All right, are we ready for a motion? So move to recommend affirmative action of an article 37 as amended and distributed to us today. Okay, is there a second? No. A second, wow, not. this is an amazing evening. Yeah, this is a wild meeting. Okay. Um, does anyone want to make any different motion? Or, like, or do you want to report How about it a motion to adjourn? That would be great, but we have a lot to do. <laughs> um, we can make a motion for no action, or we can report a town meeting. Um, Linda and Henry, what do you want to do? You know, at, at this point, given the um, state of of the um, way it's been put together and also uh, having seen, seen the full narrative 
Um, I would say no action. And I, you know, maybe by town meeting, it'll be clear. Well, that's two different things. Yeah, but then at that point, citizens can decide. Okay, so are you making a motion for no action? Um, yes. <laughs> okay, is there a second for that? <laughs> yes, I'll second that. All right. All right, so we have a motion on the floor for no action for Article 37. Um, all in favor? Aye. Only one person's in favor. Okay, so that that fails then, I guess. And um, then <laughs> we're, we're going to report producer. a town meeting, which is what I think we should do since we don't seem to know what we want to do with this article. Let's go on to Article 38 then. Um, this one might be a little easier. The petitioner is Dean Banfield. Uh, Dean, are you here? And also, I think that um, I am Wendy here. Ravelli is here, the chair of the Concord Municipal Light Plant. Um, now, we discussed this article last time, and um, I think we just delayed taking a vote to, in order to hear from the light plant. So maybe we should hear from Wendy. So Wendy Ravelli, 42 Bow Street. Um, chair of Concord Municipal Light Board. And I'm sorry I missed the conversation last week. I didn't realize it was discussed. Um, so as many may know, the Light Board did vote in favor of the article, uh, but there were several concerns raised during the course of the conversation. So I thought it was worth um, reviewing the select board here. Uh, but first and foremost, I think it's fair to say the board is unanimously in support of expanding solar generation on town property. Um, you know, it hasn't been pursued mainly because of the other priorities that the board has been pursuing over the last few years. Um, but the concerns really predominantly were in um, recognition that the light plant and the board this year in particular has a very heavy workload for this year of work and things to be accomplished by the end of the year. So the concerns are how we could actually accomplish um, the plan being built by the end of the year as called for in the article. Um, the light board um, really felt that if this was of concern to the town that we needed additional resources to be able to meet the spirit of the article. Um, there were other concerns about really the feasibility of getting this accomplished by the end of the year. And I would um, really suggest that if we're gonna have a good high quality plan well thought out with good budgets, it's a very tight time frame and may not be feasible. But, um, but what I also needed to tell you that the board did not have more time to discuss and really make recommendations around resources. Um, there is a feeling that there's a lot of demand on the light board and that maybe additional FTE resources would eventually be needed. But um, the staff as it is right now um, can't accomplish this plan, but we will need more resources if we're gonna to try to get a plan put together by the end of the year. Now, that might be consulting resources. Um, it's not clear, but the board needs more time to figure out how to do that. Um, and where that cost will come from, you know, right now would presumably be coming from the light plant. So that would be, you know, an impact to our bottom line, et cetera. So more work needs to be done there to figure out how this could be accomplished. Okay, thank you, Wendy. So the sound is not really great. I'm going to repeat back what I think I heard. I think you said the light board is unanimously in favor of it the sort unanimous. Of, oh, not unanimous. It was a four to one vote. Okay, the light board voted in favor, but you have concerns about the heavy workload that you already have, and you may need additional resources and additional time to implement. Did I basically get that right? Is that, is that correct? Yes, that is correct. Okay, thank you. All right, comments, questions from the select board? Um, I just wanted to note that I think the discussion um, was rushed right at the end of the meeting. And so while there were concerns raised about the uh, timeframe, for example, 
that the vote was not a qualified vote. In other words, they, they didn't suggest amending to extend the time. But I don't know that that necessarily reflected the whether the board would have you know, requested that change uh, because really it was right up to the last second of the meeting that this discussion was happening. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, well, I, I think agree with that, Matt. Um, but there seemed to be real momentum to vote in support of this by board members, but we will talk about it further this week and next week as well. Okay. Great. Thank you. Okay. Um, are we ready for a motion? Um, yeah, I'd move to uh, recommend affirmative action on Article 38 as printed in the warrant. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, thank you. And we're ready for Article 45, which I believe is BD Center. Does anybody have any questions or comments about Article 45? Which, which one is 45? 45 is, is the BD, BD Center, Center Enterprise Fund. I will next year. Mm. All right. Well, let's see if we can get through this yeah. year first. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> okay. Uh, any questions, comments from the board? Is everyone ready to take a position? Move to recommend affirmative action on Article 45 as written in the warrant. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, now we are going to move on to the reformatory branch, Articles 46 and 47. So um, we're going to take them together. And we started talking about Article 46 last time. I see we have the petitioners in the room for Article 47 here. Um, and I'm not sure who we have on Zoom. Um, I think I see Phil. We have Phil, Phil, uh, Phil Poser on Zoom. All right, very good. So, um, I think that the biggest question, well, there are many questions on Article 46 that I've heard raised by others, but for me, the biggest question had been about funding. And so we had information provided in our packet that a source of funding had been identified uh, from an un, un, um, unused funds from the fire department, right? Or no, the fire department. Yeah. No, yeah. For, so uh, I, for our scuba equipment or something like okay. that. No, no, for breathing apparatus. Breathing apparatus. Yeah. <laughs> um, right, I, I, I would like to comment on that further. So um, we do have some remaining funds. We have a um, the self-contained breathing ap apparatus in the fire department in the fiscal 22 capital plan. We did, after town meeting, receive notice that we had been awarded a grant, which we were not necessarily expecting. And so we don't have to expend all of the money that was appropriated at town meeting. Normally, we would just incorporate the remaining funding into the next capital article as a next year's capital article as a funding source. So if, if it's, um, $4 million and we had 100,000 left, we would ask for 3.9 of new and, and repurpose the $100,000. So I, my concern is the precedent that we are setting by, um, and previously we had talked about the $75,000 that had been appropriated in 2018 for trails as a potential funding source. My issue is the precedent that is being that, that may be set by using capital funds that went through appropriations that went through the process as, as a funding source for an article that, that comes up late in the process. My preference would be, since our budget pro forma includes, we did not anticipate the return of this capital money. My preference would be to use raise and appropriate as a revenue source for this article, which means taxation, knowing that the capital article is going to be 75,000 plus lower in new money than it would be. 
if that makes if that makes sense to you, rather than just saying we're going to go sure. to another to take capital article. The capital article for this year, Article Ten on this warrant. Yes. So oh, the I see. the okay. the new money ask would be reduced by what is left over in that fire capital article. But okay. that's money that's amortized, not money that is expended. If it's a capital article. Or is it is it or is it a capital article that is expensed? So that that was part. Let's see. I have not borrowed. I have not borrowed that yet. So we would not be. We would not be borrowing any more than we needed. So would it have any effect on free cash? No, we, we're not. That's what I thought. Okay, not, not directly. Obviously, it <laughs> right, not right. directly. There's, there's... <laughs> Everything indirectly impacts free right. cash, right? Okay. All right. Um, other questions, comments from the board, and then we're going to um, let the um, proponents. Well, I think that the cost is only. I mean, the question. I think the more important question is: Do you want to do it? not where you're going to find the money. It's mm -hmm. although if the money <clears throat> is not available, it makes it easier to decide. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm fairly well persuaded by the proponents of Article 47 that the way that Article 46 is structured, which places the emphasis on um, engineering and grading and elevations, uh, is likely to um be biased be an approach which is biased toward the development and quote quote improvement of the of that trail mm -hmm. and um i am persuaded that if we were going to do a study at all that the first issue should be the environmental one mm -hmm. and if we are going to do a study at all, which I don't see as a matter of great urgency, by the way, um, it should be focused on the environmental and naturalistic issues that are posed rather than um, whether it's too steep or too muddy or whatever. Okay. Linda? Um, I'm also concerned, besides the funding recommendation that was included in the packet, which raised a number of questions for me, but you've answered how you would prefer to um, address that as town manager. Um, but the other concern I had around this was, uh, I know that we have plans for the transportation area, we have a transportation committee, and um, this did not go through those ch channels, albeit is my understanding. Well, actually, um, I did check in with the Transportation Committee. Okay. And the chair informed me that um, they voted to recommend no action on this Article 46. Okay. Um, did they describe what their reasoning was? Uh, they might have, but I don't remember it right now. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. So, um, anyway, I. I that's helpful information. Since we are looking at um, a number of transportation issues um, before the town, you know, maybe we need to be starting at a higher level in terms of mm -hmm. planning, consultant assistance. I'm not sure what it would be. Right. Um, and that that goes through that process. One of the recommendations I saw um, in the funding recommendation to the petitioner um, was suggesting that it go to CPC uh, mm -hmm. as a potential source. You know, and we've had one situation where something went to CPC without going through the departments or without going through board or committees. And that is problematic when mm -hmm. they're not working within, mm -hmm. in general, that's problematic, not all the time, but for something this important. Right, and we did have that transportation meeting where a um, town-wide global look at our transportation was suggested. And you made the comment, Linda, which I thought was really good, that we 
take a look at trying to get that funded. Yeah, you know, well, I might not have phrased it exactly, but uh, we do have uh, Phil with his hand up. Um, Phil, would you like to respond? I think actually Nick had his hand up, but um, uh, I'll um, simply say that um, um, I have been uh, very gratified to work with the, the staff of the town, uh, and I have relied on their guidance and recommendations with regard to uh, the funding source, the change to the language of the petition, um, et cetera. Um, and um, my hope is that um, the select board recognized that uh, it's appropriate for the town to take some action um, to promote the goals that have been suggested in um, numerous planning studies over the last decade, um, which is to create trails, opportunities to get to Concord Center without having to drive and park a car um, for all folks. So the idea of the additions to the language of the petition make it clear that the intention is to study not only just a trail or not only just uh, grading and improvements, but how those grading and improvements will relate to the wildlife habitat, will relate to um, accessibility for folks with mobility issues um, and public safety. Um, all of those suggestions were made during the course of the various hearings that I have attended. And I've been very grateful for um, the various suggestions that people have made. Um, I also wanna point out that um, one of the people who I'm looking at on, on Zoom has made a suggestion that this be uh, considered a, a needs assessment as opposed to a feasibility study. I thought that was a good idea. So that language is also incorporated uh, in the text uh, of the article. So um, I really appreciate um, the select board's interest in this. Uh, I do agree that it's an important matter. And I hope that you will uh, report to the town meeting that you favor um, the idea of planning, because that's really what this is about. It's not about a construction project. It's not about uh, moving a shovel of earth. It's about making a plan and examining the issues with respect to this particular uh, very important um, town resource. And thank you for your time. Thank you, Phil. Um, I see there's a number of people in the room who want to speak. Um, I'm just going to call first on um, Nick Pappas because we did refer to the Transportation Committee. I think it's Nick who has his hand up there. Yes. I'm not sure. uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Hello. Uh, yeah, Nick Pappas, chair of the Transportation Advisory Committee. Uh, we did uh, recommend no action on this. Um, and the, at the time, the wording seems to be changing, but uh, at the time, this was a feasibility study. And the point was made in the committee that what, were we, what was the feasibility of what? Um, the real issue is the town has never stated what the purpose of the reformatory branch trail should be whether it should be a transportation trail, a recreational trail, handicapped accessible trail. Uh, and I think using this article as a way for, to force the town to make a decision is, is sort of the backwards way to do it. The town should decide that through some committee or some body that's part of town government, we need to decide what we want this trail to be. And there are very strong opinions about that in the town. I'm very uncomfortable about the possibility of a consultant who doesn't have the writ to go off and do that broad thing as part of a public open meeting law disclosure process uh, would be the best way to do it. And that's that. That's is what I took as the position of the committee as we discussed it. Thank you. Um, okay, we're going to turn to um, the participants in the room. Um, please come up to the microphone. Um, yes and give your name and address. I'm Wayne Lobb, 223 Elsinore Street. And I have a, a brief slideshow, which Chris was going to bring up for me, but I have no idea where it's going to show. I'm uh, behind you. It's behind me. Oh, this is a problem. Okay, I'll, I'll bring it up. Hold up. 
There you go. That should work. And Wayne, you recently gave this presentation at the Trails Committee, is that correct? That's right. Uh, okay. One week ago, I gave it at the Trails Committee. Um, there it is, OK. So it says, uh, first on top, Reformatory Branch Trail in Concord, which I will call RBTC to save a lot of time as I talk about it. And it also distinguishes it from RBTB, the Bedford extension of the same reform. Uh, same reformatory branch. Uh, I have uh, here 16 slides of information and data. Uh, actually, it's 15 of that and one of opinion at the end. Okay. And I will be very brief, and you can stop me or accelerate me at your wish. Next slide, please. This is a map of trails in our region of Massachusetts. The purple ones are the town hiking, walking trails. The black and green ones are the rail trails and the major bikeways in this region. Uh, let's go to the next slide. <clears throat> Zooming in on those. At the top left, you see the Nashua River Rail Trail. Next one down, Bruce Freeman, as you know, goes uh, from Lowell down to White Pond and hopefully goes to Framingham soon. The next one pointed out is narrow gauge rail trail in Bedford to Billerica. Uh, after that, the RBTB, the Bedford Reformatory Branch, that little green spot. There we go. I thought I, oh, it doesn't show. I can't use this on the, <laughs> Not on the screen. <laughs> OK, we'll just keep going. Or I can stand up, but that doesn't help anybody. Yeah, on not anybody on anyway, so. Yeah. Okay. So let's let's keep going. The the two inside the orange circle. Oops. Um, please go. Yeah. Inside the orange circle, the two green dashes are the two reformatory branches, and the gap between them and Bruce Freeman is part of a larger picture in which networks of bikeways, we hope, will come to pass throughout this region. Uh, right now, the north-south ones are a bit more advanced, and I think in part because there's less demand in their areas. Uh, but ultimately, it's the one going across the bottom, the Mass Central, uh, which leads further west and will join with other bikeways, we hope, in the, in the future. Uh, part of the whole thing is somehow linking Bedford and Concord with the Bruce Freeman, and they're I'll, I'll go into things uh, that relate to that. Next slide, please. This is the Assabet River Rail Trail uh, at the Maynard and Stowe border. It's notable because it also borders on a national wildlife refuge, and its trail that abuts that refuge, like ours abuts Great Meadows, is not paved. It's packed sand for a ways, then it's dirt at the end. Uh, it, but it's at least 13 feet wide everywhere. However, that's not true for our trail. So I'll talk about it a bit later. And I'll come back to this refuge. Next slide. This is just a map of our RBTC from bottom left at Lowell Road up to the top right uh, to the Bedford border and actually to the Route uh, 62 interchange or exchange. Uh, I put this up mainly to show that OpenStreetMap has a, a wealth of detail and it's a very good way to get your way into this. Next slide, please. So who uses RBTC? I, I think we know it's walk, on foot, walkers, joggers, birders, et cetera. One thing that I have observed, and I've been doing a lot of observing, is they come in groups or tend to come in groups uh, of two or more on foot. And about 60% of people who walk on RBT right now are walking in, in groups, typically side by side, and they're socializing, and they're slow, and they're distracted, can be, by what they're doing, especially families with small children, especially nature lovers. On wheels, we know what they are, cyclists, inline skaters, skateboarders, and US Fish and Wildlife Service vehicles, turns out they're cars, I didn't know that, uh, that drive on the, reform, on the reformatory branch, and I'll show you where exactly. Most on-wheel cyclists are solo, in my observation. 
about 60% or solo, 40% in groups. And that kind of makes sense. It's much harder to socialize and get paired up when you're going fast, relatively speaking. People on wheels also try to uh, socialize. It's much harder, obviously, if you're going faster. And they're almost always going faster than ones on foot. Next slide, please. So the fundamental use case for safety is fast moving cyclists, slow group of walkers. Uh, but cyclists are careful and will almost always naturally slow down. However, passing fast from behind, even if safely can unnerve walkers, noisy crowd, aircraft, which we have lots of over RBTC, can drown out on your left and drown out the bell. And of course, nature lovers are often distracted. Optimally, we would like to separate the on wheels from the on foot, but you need at least 14 feet to do that, which is essentially the main dimension of, of the Bruce Freeman rail trail. We don't have that luxury on RBTC. Next slide, please. There are several primary issues and factors, which I'll go through one by one quickly. Uh, the long term goal is to make that network for bicycling. But the current issue is, do we make RBTC more of a commuter bikeway now, or do we keep it as, a, as is on foot? Uh, the five things to, that I'll talk about are endangered species, no surprise, about great meadows and the deep ties between RBTC and, and it. Uh, there are granted uh, places that need better services and better drainage. Uh, we need to improve ADA accessibility, uh, but I think that the biggest single problem point is the 400 yard jog along the wastewater plant. Okay, next one, please. So number one, this is priority habitats and endangered species. Uh, any species that's been identified by the Endangered Species Act of 1990, MESA, uh, automatically makes its location a part of a priority habitat and any change made inside a priority habitat must go through the full submission and approval required under MESA. The Mass Division of Fish and Wildlife manages priority habitats and publishes lists only on a town by town basis of what those species are. Person on the street can't find out, only professionals. You don't know what exactly they are, or you cannot, as, as a public person, know what those uh, species are on a per priority habitat basis, big difference. It, it uh, has to have professional support. The reason for this is so that risky amateur efforts don't destroy more than they might have helped. Uh, note that Blanding's turtle and Britain's violets are just two out of more than 17 conquered endangered species. Not to say that they're in the area we'll be talking about, but that's part of the larger picture. Next, please. Next slide, please. Yeah. RBTC lies completely inside Priority Habitat 1581. RBTC is the slanted yellow line, bottom left, top right, followed that map that I showed earlier. Uh, if you look a little closer on the inset, you'll see that at the corner of the wastewater access and the housing there, the trail actually is inside the yellow border in the hatched area. And that is true for every inch of RBTC all the way from the Bedford line, in fact, beyond there, all the way to Lowell Road. If you look at the bottom left, you'll see a pinched area right by the Concord Lumber where it crosses Mill Brook, where it's only about five feet wide at most. So we have challenges about the sizing of this path. Next slide, please. Next slide. Yeah, thank you. Further, this same habitat extends into Bedford beyond our town line to the northeast into Bedford. The uh, plan, the 100% plan, which is now maybe somewhat in doubt, uh, goes across, uh, actually will go under Route 62, and the paving will stop about 80 yards towards our town line. But that's only a small part of the, of the path coming to our town line. And in fact, Bedford is not planning to make any changes to that stretch, that is to say from a little bit west of Route 62 down to our town line, leaving it, no matter what they do or we do, leaving it unpaved, narrow, winding, weaving with some sightline challenges. This means that no matter how much improvement is done, there still will be an area which is nowhere close to being what Bruce Freeman does. Next slide, please. 
Number two of the five, RBTC is uniquely tied to Great Meadows by birding. It's the number 22 in the top 100 birding sites in the state and the only inland one to be in the top 30 because birds love to fly through here, spend a little time and move on their way. Secondly, an extremely popular loop walk starts from the parking lot uh, for Great Meadows and goes either clockwise or counterclockwise around the dikes and must go down a 500 yard stretch of RBTC in order to finish. Otherwise, you have to retrace your steps all the way back. It is the only loop that you can do that on uh, at Great Meadows, and it is extremely popular. I've been monitoring what's going on there, and I count that about half of all the walkers on that stretch of, Monson, of, of RBTC between Monson Road and the Dyke and Edge Trails are people who are doing that loop going one way or the other. And I'm sure in summer, those numbers will be very high, probably still about 50% or maybe more than 50%. And that, we, we cannot make that change go away because we are tied, because we're in the same priority habitat as Great Meadows, that will have to continue to be true. That same stretch is where the Fish and Wildlife Service vehicles go from Monson Road up to the Dyke Trail. Um, there's a, a locked gate there that you can see. Next slide, please. It's true that RBTC needs some better services and better drainage, especially from Monument Street up to Sleepy Hollow. Also from the Great Meadows Dyke Trail up to the Timber Trail, that's a little further up towards the town line of Bedford. You can see in the picture, which is on that second uh, 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 portion, that there are leaves everywhere and they compromise the drainage and the drainage uh, uh, soaks the water, which then becomes muddy. And I've seen bicycles come up to that spot and a, a young woman crying because she couldn't go any further. Uh, the bike wheel would not hold a bit. Fallen leaves will be a challenge, whatever else is done for this stuff. The narrow gauge rail trail in Bedford uses, on the right you see uh, its surface, it uses what's called stone dust, pulverized stone, uh, a popular uh, surface, but it erodes underwater. I walked it in water and ice and mud and everything. And when it gets warm and dry, it becomes hard like pavement, and it is actually considered pavement, even though it looks like it's more natural. It works out to be classified as uh, pavement. Next slide, please. Better ADA accessibility, as Mr. Posner said, absolutely. Especially the 400-yard jog. Uh, as you're coming up, you see it in the green stripe coming up on the left. Uh, there's a jog up a little hill. There's some big boulders right near there. And then about 400 yards across the farm field and then back left and go back down to the trail. That's there because once upon a time, there was a leaching uh, pond in that area and the wastewater plant was using that property. Uh, however, it is not ADA accessible even close and it's very difficult to, um, to ride a bicycle through the groves of trees. Next slide, please. Fifth and last item, uh, as I was just describing, that former leaching pond uh, and the problems on that jog. Inside there, where there used to be the pond, you see the dashed line showing that there could be a new bikeway trail built there. It's scrubby, hardly used. I don't think it's used for anything, actually, at this point. Uh, very few large deciduous trees grow there, and they apparently can't because of what's underground in the old rail bed. There are many small conifers, but they count very little compared to any large deciduous tree. If the town were to look into this and put an investment there, perhaps through a feasibility, then we would not have to change the existing jog at all, which is a very controversial point. Uh, it, it could remain exactly as is, but bicycles and people in ADA could use this new uh, rail bed uh, extension. So, next slide, please. I've been counting users uh, now for about six weeks. Uh, about two thirds of the users that I've observed have been on foot, uh, other third on wheels. Uh, this compares with in last May, the Bruce Freeman formal count 
showed 1700 on foot and 1663 on wheels up and down Bruce Freeman, a slight uh, uh, excess of on foot over bikes, even though this is a, a bike trail. A lot of people use it and they wear grooves off the pavement on the sides. Uh, I continue to do this work uh, and I continue to see the same numbers. Next slide, please. So last slide, uh, opinion shows up. There are no bike lanes on the roads now in Concord and no bike ways east-west through town, which will be the, the larger transport uh, uh, direction than north-south. I think we already know that from Bruce Freeman. Of course, we have north-south with Bruce Freeman, at least part of the way down. Route 62 is a problem for cycles. Uh, a lot of fast moving cars, there are curves, uh, site problems uh, going over hills. Today, RBTC is the safest bike route going between Concord and Bedford. One might think the town could very advantageously study the feasibility of a new bikeway across the Massport land, which is just west, just west of uh, Hanscom, and which is not particularly used for any, anything as far as I can tell. That would mean hooking up with Bedford because you'd have to split off before 62 and go through some trail areas. There are no priority habitats involved on the Bedford side. And yet it's taken them, what, 20 years to get to the point they're at. If Concord starts to try to make big changes to the RB, RBTC, there will be a long time involved in getting the biologists of the state to make their assessments of uh, whether doing even a small amount of work is going to have a deleterious effect on the endangered species. This is not an easy process whatsoever. So my opinion, until Concord improves east-west cycling, we have to keep RBTC shared use as best we can. RBTC can and does support on, feed, on foot and on wheels pretty well, all things considered, but it, it can't serve either side perfectly, and both sides will need to adjust. I claim that the bicyclists have to adjust more because they're asymmetric. Uh, bicycles are to people as cars are to bicycles. It's uh, one is much more uh, powerful than the other. I think also the town should start counting users and usages methodically and regularly so that we have a much better and growing understanding of not just this path, but all our paths. And that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you me. very much. OK, um, other comments from people in the room? Tanya? Can I just ask Mr. Lobo a quick question? And that is, are you on the trails committee itself, or you're doing this as a, a volunteer steward for the Emerson Thoreau Amble? And I've been walking the trails in Concord for 40 years. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Thank you. Hi, thank you. Um, I I ran into Mr. Posner uh, in Concord Center ten days ago, or so, and we had a friendly chat. And he did admit that uh, his long-term goal was to extend the Minuteman Bikeway, and that in fact he considers the RBT to be an extension of the Minuteman Bikeway. He also uh, admitted graciously that he does, he, f he feels it's fine to resort to lawyers, courtroom techniques in order to make this larger, for him, very important goal come true. He also graciously conceded that my request and insistence that in public discourse, in using this very precious tool of citizen petitions and going to a public who is not made up of judges and legal professionals, that that kind of public discourse should be as truthful as possible. He considered that that was also a fair request. Um, clearly, I don't mean truth, a large truth that none, none of us can know, know but a truthfulness. I, I, I have tried to explain that Article 46 is not what it says it is. It is not about a conversation, and Mr. Loeb's enlightening comments actually demonstrate this also. I have provided documentation for a long time for, uh, to, 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 to demonstrate to you 
the collaboration between Bedford interest in extending the Minutemen bikeway and Concord interest in extending the Minutemen bikeway about supporting each other uh, by telling each town that the other one is doing it. Well, Bedford right now, as you know, passed part of its articles and did not pass the easement authorization, but there is no reason they cannot visit it again. As far as the disability access goes, the Disability Commission decided to take no action on Article 46 and Article 47. They acknowledged that all the proponents of all these two articles are certainly in favor of the mobility access, disability access to anything, frankly, who wouldn't be? However, they also recognize that this article, Article 46, or Article 47, were not about disability access. So um, my, my main request is that you recognize that this article is not what it says it is, and vote against it for that reason, if no other. Thank you. Thank you. Other comments from, um, yes, please introduce yourself. Yeah. Um, Jennifer Salt, 123 Peter Spring Road. I just wanted to reiterate the multi-use character of this trail as it already is, and the danger of losing that um, if we do studies that result in changes to it. It's a remarkable fact now that that trail is used by bikers and hikers, old people, young people, um, and it is highly accessible in part because of the parking lots of Great Meadows, the parking near the sewage treatment plant, the field is very flat, and it gives opportunity for older people and small people with small children to get out on a trail in a sort of bucolic rural environment that's actually more accessible than, say, a lot of the other trails in Concord. So if we take that away, we actually lose that multi-use component if it just becomes a paved trail. So it's not Paving might not get us further towards multi-use, but it might pull us back, in fact, ironically. Okay, thank you. Yes. Um, I'm Charles Harvey, also at 123 Peter Spring Road, um, and I'm gonna speak uh, against um, doing anything with this trail as well. But first, let me say I am all for bike trails. It was a bit of a wedge issue. I would love it if the town could connect this to West Concord, could build the bridges across the river to do that so that I could bike to West Concord. I've um, commuted on this trail for decades, usually to the commuter train going downtown on it. When I'm ambitious, go the other way, all the way to, to Alewife. And it's a wonderful trail for biking on as is. Um, so I don't think anything needs to be done to it. But I also, I also walk on it and bird watch on it. And if it were paved, it would lose that. Um, and that's, that's why I've been hanging out here all night is to uh, <laughs> argue that it's left alone uh, as it is. Thank you. Thank you. And no one is deciding tonight whether we are paving or not paving the trail. We're only deciding whether to um, study the trail. Okay. And what, what type of study it would be. Okay. Uh, other questions? Okay, we will go to some more people on Zoom. Uh, can anyone read that? Uh, who is that first person there? We've got Ellen Quackenbush and Lola. I heard Ellen Quackenbush, and I didn't hear the other person. So Lola was the name. I Lola. I don't think know who that is. Okay, Lola, I think you are first, and then Ellen. Hi. Um, I have written a letter to you all, whatever, an email to you all, and I hope that you had a chance to read it. I am, and I should probably have video with this, shouldn't I? I am a frequent user of the trail. I'm 69 years old. I'm not in fabulous shape, and I love the trail the way that it is. But even if I were a thorough, gung-ho advocate of spending 75000 plus on studying it, I would be very opposed to Article 46 because it is the shape-shifting article. Every time it is presented, it is different. And I think the whole point 
of having our lovely booklet is so that we can know ahead of time, before town meeting, what it is we're actually talking about. I think that having attended several meetings where um, Mr. Posner has been speaking, every time it's different. And I just don't think that that is an appropriate way to start. I also think that if you listen to the presentation, um, I'm bad on names. Um, uh, the fellow who also presented to the, to the trails committee, I think he's got a much better handle on everything. And, um, and we don't even start with that in there. Uh, so I am thoroughly opposed to article 46 because nobody knows what it is. It changes all the time. And I think the reason why we have a warrant is so that we know what we're voting on. Um, Article 47, on the other hand, I think it's clear. It's a recommendation. It doesn't need funding. And it's a recommendation to keep nature natural, which in this world that is burning up is a very appropriate thing to do. That's all. And I'm Lola Chase. Can you on provide your name and address, please? Yeah, sorry. Lola Chase on 77 Walden Street. Thank you. Thank you. And we will go to Ellen Quackenbush. Alan Quackenbush, 206 Prairie Street. I think uh, Lola was my straight person here. Um, I'm gonna go back to Nick Pappas's uh, comments and say that I really agree with Nick that we should step back and study the best current and future uses of performatory branch. And the Concord citizens can do this and not, and should do this, not an outside consultant. I actually, and Carmen, please keep me honest here. I actually asked Carmen, if I could make an amendment on town floor at the town meeting floor to achieve this shift. I asked if I could change the word in the amendment grading and drainage improvement to the best current and potential use. And Carmen said, and Carmen, please correct me, that I couldn't for two reasons. One, as Lola said, you know, we have a warrant because people want to come to town meeting and know what they're voting on. And I couldn't like remove the word or change the words grading, grading and drainage, because that's what people are expecting to come and vote on. And she also said that because no change in use for the trail was mentioned, the implication was that only current uses would be studied. So I really agree with Nick that it's time just to step back, do a broader study. You know, as Henry said, the environmental issues are really big in this area, the Blanding Turtles actually do cross over this trail and get squashed in the process. And that it's a perfect opportunity for a study, but it should start with the usage, the best usage, current and future. And then everything else can be brought in. I'm, you know, as much of a bicyclist as anybody else, but I think that we're, this, this article is against what I think is Concord's best practice. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any more comment, uh, Mark? Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Mark Galis, 62 Prescott Road. I just, just want to highlight again um, something that uh, Mr. Pappas mentioned that, um, and I believe it was mentioned by some uh, board members too, if we want to look at um, all kinds of uh, trails and uh, uh, bicycle paths and things in town, we should look at that comprehensively and long term. And this particular kind of targeting this particular trail where there are some obvious serious challenges to, uh, uh, you know, dramatically changing it and certain risks and a lot of expense and long term effort. I think we need to step back, uh, uh, as I believe uh, Nick Papa said, and, and look at the whole big picture. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Is there any other board question or comment? Um, I just wanted to mention that the Trails Committee did a uh, trail walk on this trail. I was only able to do the very first segment of it before I had to race off to work. But that, that was just far enough actually already to um, pass over the Mill Brook um, right next to Concord Lumber. And I don't know if you've seen that spot, but, you know, it's about four to five feet wide there and pretty eroded, too. I mean, it's on a, on a camber going down into the brook. There's a, a, you know, a stone embankment below it. And 
I mean, it just points out to me that there are uh, real drainage and grading issues on that trail um, in that this is a, a, an example. I mean, I, I tend to f prefer, as you well know, um, kind of formal processes uh, in town. I do see this as something that could be a CPC funded article in the future. I do see the advantage of a comprehensive transportation plan um, and that the transportation advisory committee should be leading that process. But I also see that this is a um, resource in town that, you know, has been a, a football that's been played back and forth on the gridiron for quite some time. Um, and I actually commend the uh, petitioner for bringing this article forward because I think we really need to um, be working on this, um, that this is not something that, you know, just if we leave it, it will uh, decay into a state that it would not be a multi-use trail anymore. Um, and so I just uh, actually still, in spite of everything else, I, I think this is a, a worthy um, thing to get the conversation started. Again, it's a needs assessment, a feasibility study, um, and it has been amended uh, as a result of feedback to look at uh, current uses, natural resource protection, accessibility, public safety, and convenience consistent with the town sustainability principles. And so I think that at this point, and I, by the way, I don't have a problem with a petitioner who has to put something in the warrant, then going to public hearings and hearing feedback and amending their article to uh, deal with public feedback. That is, there's no problem at all with that. Um, so I support this article. Okay, other discussion? <laughs> Uh, Tanya? I have sent that Bedford video umpteenth times. I don't know if any of you has watched it. It's very clear that if we pass this article here, that will enable Bedford's plans to pave. And one of the, one of the concerns proponents of Article 46 have continuously expressed is that Bedford is coming to the Concord line, what are we going to do? Bedford is coming to the Concord line, what are we, while trying to enable Bedford to come to the Concord line as a Minuteman bikeway. I, ho I hope that you see this connection. The other comment I want to make is that Article 47, uh, Mark and I, and, and most people would, would entirely endorse any action that the Trails Committee would like to take to help make this train, uh, trail better usable for everyone. We don't need a $75,000 consultant to come and enable Bedford to come to the Concord Line with a fast bikeway and, and force us to do the same. Watch the videos, please. Thank you. Okay, one more comment. Super fast question. Jennifer Salt, one, two, three, Pierce Spring Road. Why are we so concerned about the usage of this trail versus all the zillions of other trails in Concord? I never hear anyone else say X trail is not usable. I mean, there's a ton of, un quote, unusable trails in Concord. So why? I don't, I'm just wondering that. That's an excellent question. And um, I mean, there are very, very few multi-use trails in Concord. Right. But That's the reason. Okay. And there. I don't think any east-west trunk trails All right. that are multi-use trails in Concord other than this. Try and ride your bike through Fairyland. Yeah. Okay. Can I, can I speak? Uh, can I? Henry, make sure you speak through the no, microphone. I said try and ride your bike through Fairyland. So. Can I speak? This article. Uh, Terry? This, it's Nick. Nick? Yeah. Um, yeah. All right. Nick, can you make one very more brief comment, and then we're going to. We're gonna yeah, I just I just want to answer that last question about why this trail is different. Virtually all the other trails are on conservation land, and there are restrictions on what you can do. Okay, it's just a different set of playing rules. This trail is not in the conservation easement. It's basically a trail of the select boards. 
not the conservation department. That's all. Okay, thanks for that clarification. Not 100% of it, I think. So um, this is a very high interest, highly emotional article. And um, for that reason, that is the reason why I support it. I would like to see a dialogue where all the stakeholders can have this discussion that we're trying to have at 1030 at night or we can spend some time. I don't care if we have a consultant or not, but some way that we can continue this conversation and figure out what we want to do. And I'm a big supporter of Article 47 as well, which would give really good direction to the consultant or the transportation committee or whoever is leading this discussion. If Article 47 passes, it will be a really good guideline to what we want to do with the trail. So that's just my opinion. I'm, I'm in favor of both articles. I think just that we have them on the warrant, we're finally having the conversation that we really need to have. And I'm just in favor of having the conversation. I don't want to pave the road. I don't want to do anything in particular. I just want to have everybody weigh in so we can figure out what we're going to do. Um, so, uh, Mark, did you have one very brief comment? And then we're going to um, take last comments from the select board and take some votes. Um, Wait, uh, okay. Thank you. Yeah, I just wanted to point out in, in response to what Matt was saying is that we, I, I mean, there there is um, a, um, a trail used by cyclists through the Minuteman National Park all the way from Lexington. There are improvements going to be made to Route 2A. And there are, again, the Hanscom uh, area uh, paths and things to consider. And it's to me, it's kind of foolish to just jump the big transportation discussion. And there's also the question about um, if, if you um, bring a lot more bikes onto Monument Street, what's going to happen there? Okay. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to go to Lowell. OK, I'll give the last word to Wayne. Then we're going to. Um I was hoping to say something. I've had my hand raised for a while. Oh, I, I see it now. It's very hard to see over there. So okay, just it. very briefly, please. Ola Chase on 77 Walden Street. If discussion is you want is what you want, then you should propose no action on it or no opinion on it because you're not deciding whether it gets discussed at town meeting. It will get discussed at town meeting. It's on the warrant. Um, what you do if you vote yes for Article 46 is you endorse committing the town to spending $75,000 or more of our money on a study. That's what you're doing. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Wayne? Anything that's done, the ultimate decision is not going to be Concord's. It's going to be the biologists at the state level. So to go off and look into engineering, grading, anything, even that extra new thing that I mentioned, all of that is contingent on the Endangered Species Act. And so that is the thing that has to be brought first and foremost into the discussion. Otherwise, the discussion doesn't account for the facts. Thank you. OK, thank you. All right, what is the pleasure of the board? Are we ready to take a vote on 46 and then 47? Yes. Ready? Everybody's ready? Okay, so move to recommend affirmative action on Article 46 as amended and distributed at tonight's meeting. And just remind me, was, sorry, second? Uh, what discussion? Okay. Yeah. Um, funding source? And the funding source, I think, is now identified Raising. from unused borrowing authorization voted by 2021 annual town meeting under Article 13. Right. It's in the it's in oh. the revised. Just the funding issue article. The, the breathing apparatus. Yes. In the capital. Right. Right. So that's yes. So that's. That's part and parcel of this right. now. But contrary to what the town manager was recommending. Is it? No. It is, yes. Oh. I, I had suggested raise and appropriate that rather than directly 
uh, go after that capital article to, to so do raise So instead of it's transfer from unused borrowing authorization. Right. Oh. And so it would be instead of that, it would the funding source would be raise and appropriate, which is taxation. And that's a a roundabout way of using up that. Because you would change Article 10 to be 75,000 less than what it is now? Yes. Okay. So has the petitioner, have you and the petitioner talked about this at all? Or? Uh, we, we have not spoken directly about this. I, I did not see that until just before the meeting. I, I can't imagine. He, he's been working with, with staff for several months to identify a funding source. I don't think he's particular about what the funding source is. But the article just, says appropriate. The article says appropriate or transfer. The appropriation, the town transfer. Yeah, but I mean, what's printed in the warrant? No, but we're now looking at an amended. We're talking article. about a motion. When was it amended? I mean, no, it's, it's it his his proposal. This this is what he would be bringing as a motion at town meeting. Oh, but that's probably not in the scope of the warrant. No, 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 it, it is. is in scope because I, I, I in Article I Forty Six it says uh, appropriate. It says in the warrant. Right. So any. So he can identify a fund. That's right. He will. That's what's... Do we know if Carmen's seen this? If the town moderator has she, seen this? I don't want to speak for her, but I believe at your last meeting, this this came up because wasn't there a request for free cash for transfer? Yeah, and, and then she, there was communication between then and now. Right. I, I believe she's still here. I am still here. Yeah. Uh, I, my, my view was that this motion was within scope because the petitioner had left himself enough wiggle room uh, within um, uh, within the um, article to uh, identify um, a different source. And right. so this is yeah. any combination of these methods. Yeah. Yes. So and this so, is just more but, specific. But, yeah, the petitioner has been working hard to find money that was lying around that hadn't been spent by somebody else so that there didn't need to be an additional tax levy. And um, this is one of the sources that um, he has identified and um, he has been consulting with me on the question of whether various uh, permutations of his motion would be uh, within scope of the article. And um, my view is that this is certainly within scope um, and whether or not uh, I don't have any view on on the advisability or, or what the board should recommend. So I guess it gets back to. OK, let's have the motion again that. Well, I don't know. I guess I would ask the petitioner, do you want to make any other changes based upon what Ms. LaFleur just said? Or would you need to look at that offline to understand whether you need to make those changes? Then should we table this for tonight? I, I'm certainly not trying to make your lives more difficult than they may have already been. Um, I, I would want to consult with the town manager in light of her comments. Um, I reiterate that I have been speaking with the town moderator and with staff with regard to the language um, and the source of funding. Uh, and I've been guided by them um, in, in that respect. Yeah. And uh, the difficulty I think that we find ourselves in is, you know, we could make some sort of motion that like provided that the, you know, no, that's but that okay. doesn't really work no, for the, the finance committee report. You know, we can't no, put a footnote. If, if the petitioner so is not wait. comfortable, then right. we have to wait. Yeah. All right. Okay. Then we're going to report on town meeting for uh, article 46 and article 47. Is there a motion? Well, is there any more comment on article 47? No. Okay, a motion on Article 47 then. Are we ready? Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I don't have a motion to make. 
Does anyone else want to make a motion? Okay. Either of you want to make the motion on Article 47? I move for affirmative action on Article 47. Okay. Is there a second? I'll second it. Any more discussion? Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Opposed one. So Article 47, we recommend affirmative action in a vote of three to one. Okay. Now we are finally on Article 23. Uh, Kate Cavanaugh, thank you for your patience. I understand that you've been working uh, hard with Kari, our town clerk, and also the Board of Registrars. And Kari, are you there? I am. Oh, great. Thank you both yeah. for waiting. And um, my concern was that the registrars understand and have all their questions answered. Um, could you hold on one minute? OK. My concern was um, that the registrars have all their questions answered so that we know whether they would be able to implement should Article 23 pass, would the town clerk's office and the registrars be able to implement ranked choice voting if it were to pass? And would the voters understand it? Well, that's a different question. Oh, right. so, <laughs> but but um, Kari, do you want to just summarize um, the Board of, of Registrars? Yes, absolutely. Thank you. So the, the registrars met with Kate Kavanaugh, the petitioner, on March 24th, 31st, and uh, also today to ask logistical questions about implementing ranked choice voting uh, based on the draft of legislation. And, and we did get a lot of uh, responses to our questions. And we do believe that this can be implemented with a small change at the end of section two, so that it reads that the, uh, the act shall take effect upon its passage allowing for at least 64 days before the next election for implementation. And the reason for that language is that um, when we have candidates, they need time to collect signatures on nomination papers and the 64 days allows for approximately two weeks to do that. So that if, if this was passed, um, there would be time for for people to consider whether they want to um, step forward as candidates. Now, I will also say that the registrars did not take a position on whether the article ought to pass or not. This was just looking at the mechanics of the legislation. Right. Well, thank you very much for your diligence on that. Let me just make sure I understand this um, change with the 64 days. So. I think what it, the article says that if it passes at our town meeting, it authorizes and requests the select board to petition the general court. So then if the general court passes it, does it come? No, it does not come back. It says this act shall take effect upon its passage. So then you're talking about 64 days after the legislature acts. Is that correct? Yes, so that there is at least, and I, the language may not be legally correct to accomplish what it is that the registrars wish to suggest, um, but we don't we don't want to have the the act pass and then be in a position if it passes to have to figure out how to implement it for the next election if it takes its effect upon passage, and the legislature may decide that it has to go to the polls anyway. They can make okay. those types of changes and often do. Okay. So I think we need to, um, Carrie, I think if you would check with town council and, and we can figure out how to insert that 64 days um, as an amendment into this article, if, if that's okay with the petitioner. Kate? That's fine. Absolutely. Okay. 
All right, so now we are ready for questions from the board. Um, Henry, did you have a question about whether the voters will understand it? I don't understand it, so <clears throat> of course, maybe I'm a little slower than the average voter, but I mean, I can't even figure, I mean, I understand the concept, <clears throat> but I also don't see how it eliminates the, the issues uh, that people think about, like bullet voting, I think on a ranked choice ballot, you can still cast a, a one vote for one candidate, um, unless you're going to invalidate votes ballots that uh, don't vote for the right number of candidates. I don't think candidates will understand it, and it's it's really like putting it, the election outcome in in a black box. Um, <clears throat> uh, I assume that everybody's second choice could win and nobody's first choice could win or might win, that um, um, in most of our elections, we only have, we have no more than two candidates for any one position, that is when we're lucky. So it actually is just a waste of time anyway, because somebody's gonna be the first and somebody's gonna be the second. Um, it isn't like a congressional primary where you have 13 candidates who are all encouraged to jump in because of public funding and therefore it doesn't cost them anything if they can connect collect the right number of signatures i think it's um <clears throat> it might be appropriate in some circumstances i think it's just a lot more trouble co uh, uh, complication and uh, obscurity in our own local elections and I, I don't see what the point is except it's you know okay kate do you want to respond um, yes, I'd be happy to. And also, I wanted to let you know that we have an RCV expert on the call as well, uh, Greg Dennis, who is the architect of this in Arlington. Um, and he can certainly address a lot of specific questions as well. But I wanted to say that, that, this, that this is modeled on similar legislation that's passed by other communities in Massachusetts, including Arlington, Amherst, Northampton, and East Hampton. Um, I've initiated it because I believe more democracy, more better, especially these days. And Chris Carmody is ready to show a brief uh, visual that will explain RCV if you'd like to take the time to do that. Uh, anything well, that requires an expert to understand is already a problem. <laughs> okay. Um, how, how long is this visual, Kate? It's, it's two and a half minutes, and I showed it to the Board of Registrars, and they were very grateful. 39 minutes? Two and a half. <laughs> yes, sir. 39 yes, is too long. Um, well, the, the last thing. The, the, the okay, last, we will watch the, the 16 two. slides. Who is going to be Chris, brief. thank you very much. That would be slide four, please. Okay, hold on. Thank you. Oh, it has music. <laughs> There's a little bit of a trumpet sound for you, Henry. So what is ranked choice voting? In most parts of the United States, voters select a single candidate for each position on their ballot, and the candidate with the most votes wins. This is known as single choice winner take all, which can sometimes result in the election of a candidate who earned only a small percentage of the vote, even when the majority of voters supported other candidates. But that's not the only way of electing our leaders. Ranked choice voting is another voting method which allows voters to rank their candidates in order of preference. In a ranked choice voting election, a candidate needs to earn more than half of the votes to win. All first choices are counted, and if a candidate has a majority, then they win, just like any other election. If not, the candidate with the fewest votes is eliminated, and voters who picked that candidate as number one will have their votes count for their next choice. This process continues until a candidate earns a majority and is declared the winner. Let's look at an example. Here, you select orange as your first choice candidate, yellow as your second, pink as your third, and green as your final choice. The first choices are counted. Yellow earned 35%, orange 21%, pink earned 28%, and green earned 16% of the vote. Because nobody won more than 50%, the candidate with the fewest votes is eliminated, and voters who picked him as their first choice have their ballots count for their second choice. This continues until a candidate receives more than half of the votes, 
or 50% plus one. So what are some of the benefits of ranked choice voting? Ranked choice voting provides more choices, allowing more than two candidates to compete without fear of splitting the vote among like-minded individuals. Sometimes voters feel pressured to vote for the lesser of two evils. Ranked choice voting allows people to vote for their favorite candidate, not just against the candidates they dislike. With ranked choice voting, we see more positive campaigns and less negative advertising. Candidates are encouraged to reach out to as many voters as possible, including those supporting their opponents. They can build a winning coalition with like-minded candidates to earn voters second and third choices. It's time to fix our democracy and make our elections work better for everybody. We can do that with ranked choice voting. Visit www.fairvote.org to find out how you can get involved. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Chris. Okay, questions from the board. Linda. So, Carrie, are you concerned about um, educating the public on this before town meeting? Also, um, what is the cost and um, to implement this as well as if there's an auditor so that there's a paper trail? So the first question is um, educating the public before town meeting. And is I guess my, my question back is, is that the responsibility of the town clerk's office to educate the public on so what it means? About to educate the public before an election? As um, opposed so, so, to town so, meeting? Excuse me. Yeah. Since, since the question was posed to Carrie, um, fine, but actually her point is a good one. Um, speak public education uh, in 2020, when we had the ranked choice voting uh, statewide ballot, 61.4% of Concordians voted yes. So I don't think it would be an alien concept for the community. Um, and in addition, League of Women Voters are very, very supportive of ranked choice voting. And I believe that they would be very willing to help us um, over the next month or so with their public education channels. Thank you. Um Kari, if you don't mind answering the uh, one about the auditor and the cost there. Yes, certainly. So I talked to the vendor who we purchased the uh, electronic vote tabulators from, and there is additional equipment that we would either need to rent or buy when we're using ranked choice voting. Uh, and to purchase, it would be $5,000. It is an electronic election management system that would create an electronic cast vote record, which is needed in order to then use uh, freeware from a, uh, the Ranked Choice Voting Resource Center called the Universal Ranked Choice Voting Tabulator that is a, a, a logarithm that would then calculate all the different ranks um, as defined by Concord. So to purchase, it's 5,000. To rent, it's 1,550. Um, and then for at least the first time of using um, this ranked choice voting, if it was passed, um, it might be prudent to have a consultant come in to, to audit as, as we use the system to make sure that it it calculates and we are using it correctly. And that is another $5,000, but this would be a one-time fee. Um, and then there, as far as the ballot printing, that cost shouldn't change, but the coding would cost additional. Uh, ballot coding changes depending on how many, how many offices there are, how many candidates, uh, when we have ballot language, the same goes for um, the, the language of, for the voter assist terminals. I don't have the exact numbers. I did not get that information. And of course the cost for educating voters, there will, there will be a cost for that certainly. Um, Kari, I, I have Thank a follow-up question, which is, if in the case of our elections, we have just a single candidate standing, which unfortunately we very frequently do, 
or if there are just two candidates standing for a single seat position, would we just simply proceed with the conventional ballots and the conventional counting and audit and all of that stuff? We, I mean, because there wouldn't be any way to exercise the ranked choice option. That, I mean, for that, that is election, my understanding really of for it. that election. Yeah. yeah. Right. Right. I mean, because we've had very few elections where this would come into play, um, town elections. Right. right. So, so it, we may or may not have to actually make the investment, um, depending. Uh, well, and of course, this would have to we, be we, approved by this legislature. And we might given our the, track record, that could be a long wait to even right. get to that point. We might what, make the investment and then just not use it. That would be another wonderful choice. Right. right. But well, but isn't there yeah. enough, uh, if you will, a distrust of elections already? where there's a simple process that everybody understands where you just take the ballots and you count them and you know 75 is more than 50 and you have the you know what the answer is instead of feeding them into a computer which has an algorithm which does calculations which are would be difficult for most people to understand what in any under any circumstances and then expect them to have more faith in the outcome well, I, I don't think that we would be the first municipality to use this process. I mean, there is evidence have, have they out there it? of, you know, states and municipalities that have used this process. Well, that and, doesn't mean that doesn't mean they got a better result. It just means they used it. Right. It's just that it this is something that I think more um, places are adopting over time. It's not that, oh, they they tried it, they didn't like it and they threw it out. Well, you didn't, if you make, yeah, well. I mean, although I do believe there was a case in which the um, the voting was reverted back after following this ranked choice process. I'm not saying it's universally a one direction, but it's, for by and large, I think there are more municipalities adopting this over time. I, I think that there is a, a comment from yes. The we public, a, if we're done, we have a comment from I think Lola. I go. Lola, I mean, do you hi. hi. Um, I just wanted to make a comment to Mr. Dane, who can't see a circumstance where this would be more of the voter's choice than than just a straight out flat election. Let's say there are three candidates in town. Two of them get 33% of the vote. One of them gets 34%. But the two that get 33% are really very closely related. And people were kind of flipping a coin between them. Whereas those that supported the one that got the 34% either loved her or hated her. Okay? So this would be a case where then one of those that got the 33% would end up winning because the majority of the voters really wanted somebody in that vein rather than somebody in the vein of the person who had a minority of the vote um, and wouldn't have come through as a winner in anything other than a winner-take-all ballot. Does that help? It depends on what you mean as a, a as a as, as a better result. It might just be a better result to have the person who got thirty four percent to be the person that the most people wanted to have fulfill the office. I, I mean, it's it's just a definition of what how you define a good result. Okay, Kate. Um, I was wondering if Greg would be allowed to speak to some of uh, Mr. Dane's concerns. I know he has a historical and a larger perspective of uh, the adoption of RCV. I mean, I don't know. Do do any of us feel that? Has anybody not made up their mind? On yeah, the that's what I'm wondering. I mean, it's okay. it's almost 11 o'clock. So okay. that's fine, too. Um, Would that help you answer your questions? Would if, you like to hear? Do you want to hear from Greg? Or do you, are you ready to vote? Uh, I, I would prefer to vote knowing no more than I know right now. Okay. <laughs> All right. I think it then that it, uh, thank you for That's attending, okay. but um, I think at this stage, we really need to conclude. Yeah. The, All the right. Operation. I think I agree. 
All right, so are you ready to make a motion? Sure. I move to recommend affirmative action on Article 23 as amended. Or as as amended with the 64 with days. With the 64-day edition. The word smithing will be done. After, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, adoption of the legislature. Right. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? No. Okay, so that's affirmative action three to one. Thank you for your patience, Kate and Greg. Thank you for your stamina, everybody. Okay. So I would now like to spend one minute on the next item, um, which is <coughs> sign motion make makers, writers, and speakers. And what I would like to do is if each person can just take your warrant and Go through with me for a minute. I'm, I've got some tentative ideas based on Great. who is liaison, and we can see if there's any problem with it. So the first one is um, Articles 1, 2, and 3. We don't need anybody. And what we're talking about is speaking at town meeting. If there are questions, problems, you would, you would speak on behalf of the board for this article. If there's something to be written, you would write it up so articles four five and six i'm proposing susan i'll i'll talk to susan since she's not here i will do seven eight nine and ten um matt you're um the tax fairness guy so you would do 11 and 12. yes i do i do want to point out that and this will be a, probably a shock to some people i will not be present oh, at town meeting that's right so i am willing to write up the position statements and, and all of that in advance but if um, the question comes up i will not be here okay so we will need a volunteer first time in many years okay forgot about that okay i will do 13 and 14 Again, I, I can write up of any position statements or anything that you want. Okay, I think um, we, we'll, we'll talk I about mean, that I mean, we maybe don't need one. No, but some of the others we might. Right. Okay, 15, no motion expected. 16, who would like to volunteer for the five-year moratorium on the synthetic turf? Linda or Henry, do you want to I speak assume to assume that me? somebody who speaks on it is somebody who is in favor of it. Yeah, I mean, yes. we <clears throat> we voted right affirmative, affirmative action, action on that. Yeah. So, um, Linda, are you willing to do that? If not, I'm going to have so many others. I'm yeah, busy. I think, you know, I mean, <laughs> while the Recreation Commission did not uh, take a position on this, I am the liaison to the Recreation Commission. But All right, why write, not? write us up well, a statement. Why, do we but need to actually? We, we probably need don't need any of these, but we're just going through just so that everybody knows what their assignment <coughs> is yeah. in case it comes up. But it may not, come up. Not, yeah, but if I'm not, you're present, not standing you're, up. Not be and then, he, then you are going to write a statement and, and I'll read it if, or somebody yes, read it. Yes, you could read it, yes. Okay, sure. 17, 18, 19, 20, I'm going to do, I'll do 21 and 22. 23, ranked choice. I could do it. All right, Matt, thank you. Um, 24, affordable housing. I assume that's going to be me. Right. Or and, I could. I'm fine with it. Well, you. Linda will be here, so I think. Okay, so Linda, can you do 24, 25, and 26? Mm -hmm. Okay, 27 and 8, I will do 29, parking meters. Any volunteers for that? I mean, I, I could do it. Well, wait, did you give me any? Or, or Not you... yet. Oh, so you can you. volunteer, but you're getting some in a minute. So okay. stand by. OK, Linda, I have you for 30, 31, 32, 33, 34, and 35. That's all. Oh. A lot of them are consent calendar. <laughs> um, yeah, um, OK. What we'll do is we'll go over I mean, again, this again I, next I could, time. I could pitch in on, on zoning bylaw amendments. I'm... Okay, why don't you two talk before next week and maybe Linda and Matt will write some up for you. Or um, I will do 36. Um, who wants to do 37? I, I would be happy to do that. Okay, thank you. Matt, I've got you for 38 and 39. Henry, you are 40, 41, 42, 
43, and 44. Just going by liaison assignments. Uh, Matt, 45. Um, okay, who wants to do 46 and 7? I'm going to give those to Susan because she um, has been a big study of these two articles anyway. Um, and I'll do 48 and 49. So what we'll do is everybody review this. If you have a problem, we're going to talk about it again next week. We'll go over it and make sure we're okay with it. So, Matt, if you could help with a couple of the zoning ones, because yeah. I, I know that I'm going to have You're some be heavy small. duty on some others. Well, how about if I take, I mean, you know, again, looking at the ones that are likely to need a statement. Okay. I mean, like 33. Okay. Um, the, and, and the additional dwelling unit, I feel like I should do because that's Un, unfinished business from when I was on the planning board. That's number 31. <laughs> 31 and 33 I could do. Okay, great. Okay. Thank you. All right. Now we are going to move on to committee nominations. Okay. Um, yeah. Mark W. Giddings, uh, 474 Barrett's Mill Road to the planning board with a term beginning June 1st, 2022 and ending May 31st, 2027. And committee appointments. Uh, move to appoint James Bartlett Littlefield of 523 Bedford Street to the Board of Registrars for a term that expires on April 30th, 2025. And Ha Richmond of 144 Neshoba Road to the Cultural Council with a term that expires on April 30th, 2025. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, we now move on to liaison reports, which we are going to do next week instead, seeing as how it's after 11 o'clock. And miscellaneous correspondence, we had a lot of it this week from many people regarding many town meeting articles. And we are now on to public comment. Is there any public comment in the room? Okay, what about on Zoom? Yeah. Yes. Carmen. Carmen. Yes. Um, I just want to mention that um, on the issue of parking, in 2013, the town spent a significant amount of money having a comprehensive parking study done by Nelson Nygaard. And there are a number of paper deliverables, reports of various kinds that um, are still around on that. I, I uh, found during the meeting a few of them uh, just doing a search on the town website and I would recommend them to you for uh, background on data and parking and the thinking behind uh, the decisions that the town made with respect to parking meters. Thank you. That would be extremely helpful. We do have scheduled um, for the spring or summer a, a comprehensive discussion on parking. That would be extremely helpful. Thank you. Other public comment? That she was recommending for the Warren article, too. Oh, Carmen, are you recommending those materials as handouts for this warrant article, or are you oh, recommending? No, 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 not at all. Just, to, just, just if you're thinking about parking in a more comprehensive way, that'll give you some background. Um, right. The, um, the, the, the parking article is really a much more of a ministerial thing that is just authorizing right. the expenditure of the collection of funds on the meters that exist. So, right, no need. Thank you. Kate? Um, I just wanted to thank you, Terry, uh, Kari, Chris, uh, Carmen, all of you for your support and helping me through this process. You really are amazing public servants. Thank you. Thank you. OK, is there any more public comment? Seeing none, we are ready for a motion to adjourn. Move to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you very much, everybody, for your patience.